Well, hello to all of you and welcome back to another webinar. <clears throat> uh, Lee is definitely making sure that her and I are working hard this week. We had uh, what over 400 people on Monday night and uh, 200 people in China yesterday and uh, got a good couple of hundred people this evening. So uh, thank you very much, Lee. It's been a busy week. And uh, while, uh, while others are preparing and, and a lot of people are on holiday this week, uh, we certainly are out there trying to share as much information as possible. So uh, welcome, Lee. Thanks for setting up tonight. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Good evening, everybody. It's great to be online with you. Thank you for sharing the next hour and a half with us. We really do appreciate it. As always, I'm here to keep Scott on his toes and make sure that he answers any questions that you have. So you will see in the top corner that you have a chat box. That's where you can drop any questions or comments. And also, if you just want to start out by telling us where you are joining us from, we like to see um, where we're reaching. And um, we've had some pretty interesting ones between our last two webinars coming up, countries that we haven't had any more, oh, sorry, had before. Um, so it's been a rather interesting week for us. So if you wouldn't mind just popping in, saying hi to us, so that we know that you can find the chat box and um, you'll be able to ask questions as we go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, Lee, I, uh, I know you said 90 minutes, but uh, it's quite interesting because for me, this is one of those webinars that I, um, it's my favorite webinar of all the webinars actually, uh, because what we've done this week is we've been looking backwards and we've been trying to figure out what's happening in the markets and where they're going and you know everything else, whereas tonight's, not about the past, it's about the future. <clears throat> and I, I love it. I love, uh, I love opening up the window into that future and, and where we're going. And I think one of the things that's important, we were given feedback uh, when we've done this webinar before, it doesn't drastically change, you know, whether you've had COVID or not had COVID. And the reason being is that long-term trends don't change. Uh, long-term, that's why they're long-term trends. And so things like COVID, you know, they, they, they tend to accelerate the trends or slow them down, but the bottom line is they are still long-term trends. And so one of the things I enjoy doing is that this presentation is something that I've actually worked on for the best part of 20 plus years, uh, considering I did my first dissertation in, in 1998 on this topic. I did my master's in 2001 on this topic, and we've just been evolving it and getting it a little bit tighter every time. So it doesn't drastically change. But I can see here we've got the UK, Zimbabwe, uh, Netherlands, South Africa. Where's that one there? I can't see. London. Oh, great. So we've got lots of different, uh, lots of different nationalities. Well, anyway, welcome. It's fantastic. I am uh, conscious I'm going to have to figure out my lighting at night. My teeth go blue. So <laughs> it's weird. Like suddenly I, I, I always want to smile and suddenly I feel weird, so, you know, smiling. We see we've also got Cyprus. No. Uh, hey? There's this thing that Bruce Banner turns into the Hulk. Well, Scott turns into a smooth. That's what happens <laughs> when the sun goes down, guys. Yeah, so anyway, but uh, let's rock and roll. Uh, let's have some fun. Lots of content to give you tonight. We are recording it. And uh, if you want to come back and listen. You know, the intro and, and why we're we doing it is is for me important. You know, this is a picture of me and my dad when I was uh, 13 years old. And, you know, really at a, at a very young age, I learned that to do what we were all taught to do was wrong. You know, go to school, go to university, get a good job, get a good, you know, get a degree, etc. And the reason being is my father did all of that and, and, and still ended up broke. And I decided there just had to be a better way. And I really love property. As I said, this was my first project when I was 13. And I also love technology. I did my first programming course when I was six. Uh, this is actually a Commodore 64, and I was programming a Logo Turtle. And, you know, I've always been trying to marry the two together. And when you play a game like Monopoly, which most of us grew up loving, it was like, why couldn't we take the game of Monopoly and make it a reality by bringing property and technology together and making it easy and simple so that we could all play global Monopoly in real life? And then lastly, growing up in Africa, you know, there's, there's such a wealth gap and you see it every single day. Income inequality, wealth gap, call it whatever you like. And it's in your face. And, you know, <clears throat> growing up in, in emerging markets, you really want to try and solve grand challenges. And so for me, you know, when, when I looked at property, it was like, surely there must be a better way of doing it. So I wanted to start with a quick video, which will get the energy up and, and just explain a little bit about uh, why and how we can do that.
Welcome on a journey. And so this is a slide that I've loved for many, many years. And Napoleon said the right information at the right time is nine tenths of any battle. And the challenge is, is what information do you look at? You know, when we look at the newspapers, it's all doom and gloom. They call CNN crisis network news. And, you know, literally it's all about the shutdown and what we will or won't do. I was on a webinar uh, with uh, Roger Hamilton uh, last week. and Actually, what was really interesting is that uh, he he went and he, he had a whole lot of links. And um, this is the first one, apparently in America, 31% uh, of people can't pay rent. Just by the way, Lee, I love showing people articles and a Wealth Migrate ad popping up um, at the same time. <laughs> Good on Google. And uh, so this, this here is, uh, I'm just going to click through them. This is uh, one third of Americans missed their rent payments in April. We had a very interesting webinar. Uh, last night, uh, Monday night with South Africa, where it's uh, it's as, as high, if not higher, credit card defaults in China. Um, there's, uh, there's there's so much news out there around the impact that uh, coronavirus is having on consumers and consumer debt and, and consumer defaults. And um, when one looks at it, you 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 can be consumed. I mean, you can literally sit there all day long reading newspaper and, and how bad the world is getting. Sorry, the internet's a little bit slow here. Um, I'm gonna open up all these links. I don't know why they haven't opened automatically. I had them all open earlier. But anyway, I just wanted to show you, um, if we go back through them, hopefully some of them would have opened. But just, just really in terms of uh, information, you know, you can see basically unemployment in the US and the UK may worse uh, into a Great Depression. UK economy shrinks to 35%. So it shrinks 35%. <clears throat> There's one here. Unemployment at 10% in Australia. You know, a whole bunch of properties are being, uh, being repossessed here. Home lenders up to 15 million mortgages. Commercial real estate, you know, 80% of tenants are not paying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, if you are interested in all these articles, I can share with you the links. Um, as I said, Roger Hamilton shared them with me. So one of the things that's, that I find fascinating when one looks at all this news is it immediately puts our brains in crocodile uh, mode and we go into fight or flight. And something that I learned many, many years ago and have been teaching people for, for years and years and years is that it's all about cycles. You know, what happens in these times is that most people go to the right-hand side of the graph and they get into fear and they think, oh my word, you know, the world's crashing, it's never going to be the same. This is it, this is the end. <laughs> and most of you were probably alive 10 years ago and can remember very clearly that 10 years ago you felt the same way, that this was it, this was the big one. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting is that actually you need to focus on the left. And you need to focus on the long-term fundamentals. You need to focus on where the world is going. And that can really, really assist you. You know, in 2015, I created this uh, slide and it was talking about online engagement and the maturity of online um, users. And it was over time. And you can see that in the beginning, people consumed. They, they, people published stuff and they read it. Then they started to participate, like social media. Then they started to buy stuff online, e-commerce. And finally, you've got social commerce and e-commerce come together, which is social commerce or online investing. And, you know, five years ago, everyone thought that we were stock staring mad when we spoke about that. And yet it's becoming more and more a reality. All of us are online and all of us are, 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 are in social media and on e-commerce. But what most of us are not on is in social commerce. 
And so what's fascinating is that when you look at what's happening with coronavirus is that this was all my friends on Zoom. And about uh, four or five weeks ago when we went into lockdown, we all got on Zoom. We had 16 friends from six different continents uh, get together. And what I found fascinating is the majority of my friends, my corporate friends, had never used Zoom before. In fact, I had a guy just yesterday from one of the top banks say to me that I was the very first person that invited him to a Zoom meeting ever. And so that's fascinating for me that in December, there were 10 million Zoom users. And you know, for us people using Zoom, we're like, how the hell did the rest of you ever survive without Zoom? And now it was 200 million Zoom users at the end of March, and it's now gone over 300 million Zoom users in three months. Now that's a 30-fold increase in three months. And you can imagine that their share price is uh, going through the roof. What about online exchanges? You know, what's what's really interesting is that the JC, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, the London Stock Exchange, they've never looked done online AGMs. They've always had physical AGMs. And again, I find this absolutely fascinating. You know, we've got we got shareholders in 43 countries, and we've been doing online AGMs since 2014. And uh, and yet in the last month, they had the very first online AGM. Um, from one of the top exchanges, and it was actually Alexander Forbes. And so whether you wanted to go online or not, they were forced to. And what's really interesting to me is that when I look at it, the easiest and most simple way to describe it to people is the adoption curve. Because in any new technology, they talk about the adoption curve. And in the beginning, you've got the innovators and then the early adopters. And, you know, the classic example for me is, is my cell phone. You know, in 1999, I... I graduated out of university in 1998. I went to London in 99. I was 21 years old, and I got myself a cell phone. And I remember getting hold of my mother and saying, Mom, I got a cell phone. And she was like, wow, that's extravagant. See, that's a classic example of pleasure. So I, I'm an early adopter. I'm an innovator, and I like to go towards something. So I thought having a cell phone would be so cool. Nowadays, every single one of you on this call, I virtually guarantee you has a cell phone. And if you don't, you are literally disconnected from the world and, and basically can't connect or work. Okay, so what happens is that the late majority and the laggards, you know, eventually get involved. They have to. You know, my mother didn't want to do internet banking because she, she was worried they were going to steal her money. And yet now she's doing internet banking and, and lucky for her, you know, she, she had to do it because, you know, she wouldn't even be able to get to the, to the bank now. Um, and even more recently with e-commerce, my mom tried to buy something online over Christmas and, and she ordered three presents and only two turned up and she was so irritated and she was like, I'm never shopping online again and this is absolutely ridiculous. And what was so interesting is that she's now shopping online um, because she needs to, otherwise she can't get food. And so she's doing her online shopping. And so that's what is called pain. And what happens with pain is it drives people up the adoption curve. Because what's interesting when it comes to human psychology, is that people move four times more away from pain than they do towards pleasure. So it's really interesting. If you take yourself, you will move four times more away from pain than you will towards pleasure. And that is why that in times like corona, you get such societal changes because people are moving away from pain and not towards pleasure. Now, what does that mean? Well, when you look at it, if you take a company like Uber, in 2009 when Uber started, People didn't want to drive cars. They didn't want to drive around at night and, and have to go and pick up other people. And people certainly didn't want to pick up, you know, get a car to pick them up because, you know, how do I know who these people are and how do I trust them? Well, the thing in 2009 is we just had the last crash and people were out of work and they needed to be able to do it. Otherwise, they couldn't get a, they couldn't make money. And people wanting to catch rides, it was much cheaper than catching taxis. So it just made sense. And that's how Uber started. So it was in the middle of a crash that Uber started. Airbnb was exactly the same thing. People didn't want to rent out their room. How awful would that be, having someone sleep in your house? And other people certainly didn't want to go and stay in someone's room. I mean, how cheap are you? How pathetic are you that you can't stay in a hotel? You're going to stay at someone else's house. Well, again, you know, you, you've got space at your house. You need to make money. You might as well rent it out because you can make some extra money. And you're traveling or you're going to a concert and you don't have the money to stay in a hotel. So you stay in an Airbnb and, you know, today, today we've got Airbnb. 
And so what's really interesting is that in times like this, you know, most people, the majority of people make excuses and, and some people get very resourceful. You know, just to name some companies that have been built in major recessions or depressions, just a few of them that you might or might not recognize. Amazon, Microsoft, FedEx, Alibaba, um, Apple, uh, Walmart, you've heard about Airbnb and Uber, uh, eBay, Salesforce, just, just, just a few of them and we could go on and on and on. So not only tech companies, many mainstream companies have also been built uh, during recessions because what tends to happen is that the majority of people are making excuses and feeling sorry for themselves and a elect few get very resourceful. And it's in that time of being extremely resourceful, the tremendous opportunity presents itself because you're having a societal shift as society moves away from pain and you get this change. And whether we like it or not, we're moving into Wealth 5.0. We've been talking about this for a while. There's Society 5.0, there's Entrepreneur 5.0, and there's Wealth 5.0. And whether we like it or not, this is happening. And so I tend to invite people and say, well, you can fight against it or you can go with the change. You know, something I learned as, as a business person is that, you know, it's much, much easier to swim down river with the, with the, with the flow of the river than to swim up river. You know, it's much easier to catch a wave uh, on, on the ocean if you're catching the wave versus trying to swim into the waves. And so the purpose of tonight is to share with you the direction of where the world's going. And, and no disrespect, but with or without your permission, the world is going in this direction. And so you can either swim upstream or you can go downstream in terms of where the world is going. And what is Wealth 5.0 all about? Well, the first thing is that people want to know about their impact. What impact are they having on the planet? What are they doing to create a better and more sustainable planet for all? What is their footprint, whether it's their carbon footprint, their plastic footprint, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's about creativity. How creative are you and how much value are you creating for others? I always teach my son, if you want to make money, figure out how to add more value. The third thing is high touch. So it's, it's good to add value to one person, but how do you add value to 10 people or 100 people or 1,000 people or a billion people? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's, if you want to make money, it's how do you add more value to more people, but in a personalized, high-touch way. The third thing is high-tech. Uh, sorry, the fourth thing is high-tech. How do you use technology? Now, what's so interesting is that when you caught your last Uber, did you uh, phone your friend and say, listen, I'm coming on an Uber. See you in 10 minutes. Or did you phone your friend and say, I'm using TCIP HP and I'm going to be using the electronic codes uh, behind the internet, which are going to send noughts and ones down the internet, <laughs> ultimately used by the internet. And uh, then I'm going to be using this app on the internet, which is going to help me book a car and get me from A to B and help me arrive. Not at all. No one cares about the technology. They just care about the application. They just care about the, the, the I'm catching an Uber. And it's exactly the same thing. You don't need to understand. I have a master's degree in technology cum laude. It's not about that. It's not about the programming and understanding the languages. It's about understanding the application of the technology. And the last part, number five, is digital. The world is going digital, whether we like it or not. And interesting for me is that, you know, we're having this webinar now. Uh, many people, it's their first webinars. Certainly most of the business people I work with, it's they're running webinars for the first time. I do find it very interesting. I've been working from, from home uh, and, and digitally since 2004. We did our first webinar in 2008. And so this, this really hasn't changed anything. In fact, the fact that I can't go running and go on my boat and, and buy beer is, is literally the, the, the three things that uh, the coronavirus has stopped for us. And, I, and I'm sorry if that sounds really negative, but business has not changed one bit. And uh, in fact, it's got a hell of a lot more busy. And so the question for you is how do you go digital? How do you solve people's problems? And how do you future-proof them? And so what that means is find people's problems and solve it for them. So future-proof it, which basically means you solve their problems and you give them a better future. Now, whether you like it or not, this is a formula, Wealth 5.0, and you get to choose whether you're gonna go with this or away from it. Now, tonight I'm gonna to be sharing with you all the applications that I think you can be using to go with 
Wealth 5.0. And what I'm going to be sharing with you later is that one of the things that we've invested the last two decades of our life in is how to make property investing easy. How do you make real estate investing easy? And something we, we came up with in 2014 was we allowed shareholders or investors to actually invest in our platform. So in our company, so to become shareholders of the likes of Amazon or Alibaba, we allowed them to do that and participate in our, in our company. And I'm going to share with you at the end tonight, if it's not for everybody, but if, but if you are interested, I'm going to share with you how you too can do that, how you can get a discount, and also how we've agreed a, a RAND hedge, uh, so that although the RAND, you know, some people are all over the world, um, some are in South Africa, and the RAND has spiked uh, terribly, and, and we, I'll explain to you how we've got a RAND hedge, where you can actually invest at 15 RAND uh, to the dollar. And the question really for all of you, as I invite you on this journey, is is that whole thing of are you going to keep doing what you've always done and expect different results or are you going to do something different now just by the way if you keep doing the same thing and expect different results that's the definition of insanity so as the world is changing you get to choose are you going to play to where the world is right now or even worse where the world is was a year ago or are you going to play to where the world is going and as wayne gretzky one of the greatest ice hockey players said he you know you know the good players play to where the puck is which is where the ball is the great players play to where the puck is going and that's our invitation to you tonight on this journey so a quick question that i always like to ask because i want to get your brain working who is ronald wayne can anyone tell me if you want to tell me in the chat box who is Ronald Wayne? And while you do that, I'm going to have a sip of water. Just a quick one. I just want to ask a quick question. Um, someone's saying that I should switch my video off. Um, because the connectivity of my sound is not coming through very clearly. Um, it is a little bit surprising to me because I've got a 100 meg uh, line, but is that, the, is that the case for everybody? And if that is the case, I'm happy to switch the video off. I just want to make sure it's, everyone's experiencing the same problem. So it's interesting. A couple of people have come through and said, uh, Apple and uh, uh, no, not for me, no problem. Sound is good. Okay. Okay, well, that's good to hear. Uh, just let me know, Lee, if there's any problems. Uh, people are going founder of Apple. So you're right. You, some of you have seen this, uh, seen this before. And uh, really, that, that is the truth. He was the third shareholder of Apple, 10% in Apple. And he owned 10% uh, in 1976, which he sold for $2,300 that today is worth over $70 billion, billion with a B. Um, and a lot of people, you know, look at that and they balk at that and i tend to say to people you need to be able to look into the future you need to be able to understand long-term trends and don't get me wrong plenty of businesses would have gone bankrupt and you know he took his money out and his two thousand three hundred dollars were probably very important to him and he didn't lose his two thousand three hundred dollars i don't think and so you know it might have been the right decision hindsight's always 2020. however the invitation tonight is that you know, the right information at the right time is the nine-tenths of any battle. And, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you the right information so that you can make uh, the right type of decisions. So, you know, I often like to, to talk about this, but Delta was the oldest airline in 19, started in 1924, it's the biggest in the world, it's the oldest operational in the world. It's quite interesting. I, I've uh, spoken about this for probably a year, Lee, and I might have to update this uh, quite soon because, you know, all these companies might, might be out of business, but who knows. Um, they fly to or did fly to 334 cities in 64 countries. They've got 80,000 employees and they were worth about $37 billion, of which half was airplanes. And you compare it to Uber that was started in 2009. It's in 63 countries and 785 cities worldwide. It's got 22,000 employees and it's worth over $50 billion. And then the Marriott Hotel, you know, 1927 is when it started, 200,000 employees. It's got 4,087 properties. It's in 80 countries. 
It's got 697,000 bedrooms, and uh, it's worth $18 billion. And just by the way, it was the first hotel group worldwide to go online. And, you know, you compare that to Airbnb, and they've literally got 3,100 employees in 81 cities, 191 countries, with 5 million listings. So six, seven, eight times the size of, uh, of Marriott. And um, it's just fascinating because how the world is changing. Sorry, Lee, is there something I'm doing right or wrong? No, I, no, 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 you're doing everything right. I just wanted to comment and say that it's going to be interesting to see the same presentation in a year from now when we are on the other side of COVID because Airbnb, um, Uber, they all joined the presentation due to how society had to change and adapt after the last financial crisis. So it is going to be interesting. It's going to be fascinating to see how resourceful they are, because you know I think I think Airbnb is a phenomenal company. I don't I don't speak as highly for Uber. I think Airbnb is just well run. I've I've read a lot about them. They've got a great team. I'm an Airbnb customer, both as a supplier and a user. It's a great experience. And I mean, you know, I I thought it was bulletproof, <laughs> quite frankly. And uh, and you know, Corona came along, so it's going to be interesting to see how. Uh, how they how they improvise basically and how resourceful they can be. Absolutely. What's fascinating though is they're a community company, and uh, and and people believe in them and believe in their brand and their community, and therefore they will be able to pivot a lot easier than Uber, where no one, well certainly the drivers don't like Uber. So you know it's it's not they don't have the brand loyalty that, that Airbnb does. So I wanted to share with you this slide. And it's a really interesting slide, and it, it comes from the Wall Street Journal. And again, it'll be really interesting to see some of these stats updated over the next uh, six to 12 months. But what's really interesting is that these are technology companies that have disrupted industries and the value which has been created uh, during this time. And what, what, what I would hazard a guess on is that this might be like a dot-com um, boom bust where the internet you know, prices of companies like Apple, uh, you know, went down, etc. But the good companies didn't go anywhere. And the good tech companies that are disrupting industries, like Uber as an example, I love Uber. And I don't know how I live without Uber. And so as soon as we get back away from coronavirus, you know, we're all going to go back to wanting to use Uber. And, and you know, that, that for me I find fascinating in terms of how these technology companies have created this value. And as the world changes and as we all go online, you know, I would hesitate a guess to say in the short term, these numbers in terms of these billion dollar companies might, might slow down or even reduce for the next six to 12 months, maybe even two years, and then they're gonna accelerate again because of the adoption that, that we've been talking about in terms of social commerce. So you can just, you can just see here as it, as it goes through uh, the different, uh, the different periods and, and, and what has been created over time and, and, and the value that's been created as these technology companies disrupt industries. But what I think is really important is that if you take any one of these companies and, and what has actually happened and any one of the brands that, that we all understand and associate with, I'm just going to let this finish before I go to my next slide. Let's just go quickly through to the end. So if you, uh, if you go to any one of these brands, be it Amazon, EasyJet, Alibaba, Airbnb, Google, eBay, etc., there's actually only three things they do. They cut out the middlemen, they cut out the costs, and they dramatically increase the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility. Now, What's fascinating is that this slide has made the rounds on, on uh, social media and Facebook. I've been sent it about a thousand times. And it talks about how Uber's the largest company with no vehicles and Facebook the largest media owner with no content, Alibaba the biggest retailer with no inventory, and Airbnb the largest uh, accommodation provider with no real estate. But what's really interesting is that what people miss here is that the, yes, they don't own assets and Yes, they, you know, they have technology companies and all that. But in simple terms, there's two things that are important here. The first is that they're data companies. It's actually all about the data. You know, they, they've been saying for a while now that data is the new oil. 
And, you know, I think it's certainly taken over from oil, considering oil's gone to virtually zero. But what's more important is that what I learned when I went to Singularity University, and I was very privileged to go to Singularity University, and I learned from a guy called Ray Kurzweil, who I'll talk about a little bit later. And he said there's only two things you need to look for in an industry that's going to get disrupted by technology. Two things. He said the first is that it's a horrible user experience. And the second is that it's expensive and inefficient. And so when you think about it, think about taxis. You know, before Uber turned up, whether you're in London trying to catch a black cab or in, you know, Shanghai or New York or, or Johannesburg, it was a horrible, horrible experience. And on top of that, it was expensive and inefficient. I mean, I've been doing it for 20 years and, you know, probably like you, I've got some terrible, terrible experiences and stories. And yet, come along Uber and it was a much better experience. It was cheaper, it cut out the middlemen, and it increased the trust, the transparency, and the accessibility, which is why today you have Uber. So when you take the property industry, the real estate industry, you know, the commercial industry alone is a $13 trillion industry. If you take residential into account, it's a $217 trillion industry. And I'll ask you the question, is it a good experience buying and selling a house, investing, renting, or anything within the spectrum of real estate? And secondly, is it efficient and, 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 and cost-effective you know, industry? And the answer is no. I mean, it's one of the oldest, most archaic, inefficient industries in the world. When I did my master's and my dissertation, well, firstly, my dissertation in 1998, my master's in 2001, on how technology, how IT was changing, information technology was changing this industry, I tend to joke with people, but even my professors couldn't spell IT in this industry. And that's why when we did a CEDARS campaign, people from you know, 43 different countries, investors from 43 different countries actually invested in our company because our purpose was to make global property investing available to anyone, anywhere, from any amount, safe and simple. And we raised two and a half million dollars. And what I think is important is that we offered people the opportunity where rather invest you know, once you only invest in an IPO, once you invest in a Facebook or an Amazon, once they IPO, you know, none of us can get involved in an Uber or an Airbnb because we, we're not private equity. You know, very few of us have the ability to get involved in growth companies because we just don't know about them. And, and we don't really want to get you know, involved in ranked startups because the majority of them fail. And yet what, what technology is now allowing and what we're doing is allowing people to participate up the value chain and ultimately you know, to, to invest at, at, the, at the growth stage. Now, let's look at some of these trends around the world. One of the best books that I can recommend is this book called New Power. Now, there's actually a Harvard study. You can go and read all about it. And it talks about a new power model and, and new power values and an old power model and old power values. And you can see the different uh, quadrants here. And what's really interesting is that Richard Branson actually said this was his best book of 2018. And I took this whole model and, and book, and I literally put it on a one page. And on the left-hand side, you can see the return. It goes from top, uh, sorry, from bottom to top. On the top, you can see that global and purposeful goes from left to right. On the bottom, you can see exponential from bottom to top. And, on the, and, and over here, from left to right, you've got short-term risk. You've got the old power model, old power values. You've got the new power model and new power values. Now, to give you an example, Encyclopedia Britannica, when, you know, used to be the bastion of knowledge. None of us, you know, all of us learned by, by going and reading an Encyclopedia Britannica. And if our parents had money, they would buy us a set of Encyclopedia Britannicas to have at home. And then Wikipedia came out and, and all the professors said, it's an absolute hypocrisy. And how can they do it? And it's going to denigrate information and knowledge. And it was complete rubbish because Wikipedia today is the eighth most visited website in the world. It's the most trusted source of information. It's by far and away more, more accurate than any Encyclopedia Britannica. And what's interesting is that there's 19 million people around the world that have the ability to actually update the, the Wikipedia. Okay, so not you and I, no, not every Joe Soap can go and do it. Only 19 million people are credited to be able to do it. It's a classic example of new power. Marriott Hotels, We've spoken about them, old power, Airbnb, new power, all about communities and growth. 
There's another great book I'd highly recommend called The Upstarts, if you want to learn about this mentality and how Airbnb was built through community. What about Barnes & Noble, the bookstore, and Amazon, the, the global platform? And then lastly, you know, when it comes to traditional investing or, or property companies, you know, they're good, arguably, right now, but that's not where the world's going. Platforms is where the world's going, platforms like, like Wealth Migrate. And what's interesting to me is that the short-term risk at the bottom might be left to right, but the long-term risk is definitely right to left. Now, I've been saying this for a while, and that was way before Corona. And what's interesting, Corona comes along, and all traditional businesses have literally fallen apart. All these businesses in the bottom left-hand corner are literally at a standstill. I had a coaching session today with my business coach, and he said all his directors that he works with can't sleep because their businesses have literally gone to a standstill. And yet what's interesting is all these businesses in the top right corner are flourishing. We had the most people sign up last week that we've ever had on our platform. Just last week. There's a classic example of what I'm talking about. So let's look at some of these trends. One of them that the people actually use, but they don't know how it works, is social proofing. So I bought uh, rugby tickets. I love rugby. And in 2003, I, I spent 11,000 pounds buying rugby tickets for me and my friends to go to the Rugby World Cup. And we got scammed. And I bought them on eBay. And so I figured out pretty quickly what this thing was on the right-hand side, which is social proofing. And ultimately, you know, if I buy something or if you buy something from 7104 Leslie, who's done 974 transactions with 100% positive feedback, you have more way to trust 7104 Leslie than you do your own brother or sister because they are not going to ruin their digital track record to try and scam you. Now, we book airplane flights like this, we book hotels, we go to restaurants, we even date using the service, but we don't invest yet. And what's interesting is that when you take e-commerce, whether it's eBay or Alibaba or, 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 or Amazon, social proofing's all over the place. We've got rankings, we've got stars, we've got positive feedback, we've got top rated sellers, and, and all the different um, badges and, and things that take place. They call them reputation management systems. And if you take Alibaba, you know, the number of years they've been on, they've got a, a whole thing, a whole system with diamonds and supplier assessments and how many transactions they've done. eBay's got a very similar thing. So the question I always ask is when it comes to property investing or investing full stop, why could you not have the same thing? Why could you not have years in business, projects to date, niche focus? amount of money they're putting into the deal. Wouldn't you like to know how much money they're actually investing? The risk that they're assuming on the project, I'm talking about the partners, the responsiveness to communication. I mean, I've been in the property game for, for 20 plus years and property people traditionally are horrendous at communication. Timing of dividends. What about accuracy of returns? What's more important to you? Someone says that they're gonna give you a 10% return, but then actually pays you a six, or someone who says they're going to give you a six and actually pays you a seven, which one would you rather invest with? I'm willing to bet you that you would much rather invest with the second one because there's a much better accuracy of prediction to actuals and, uh, and then different types of rankings. What about due diligence? You know, there's a whole bunch of different systems here, but, but if you take due diligence and you take Wikipedia as an example, the professors thought that they were the bastions of knowledge. When it comes to property, the, the current mindset is that six old gray-haired men are going to sit in an office in London or New York or Pretoria and make decisions because they're the all-knowing of, of all property in the world and all trends. And I don't believe that's where the world's going. I believe it'll be very much like Wikipedia where property is always going to be localized. There's always going to be local knowledge and there can be accredited people in local markets that can be part of a trusted global network that can allow global investors the ability. Because if you're going to invest in Mumbai, would you rather invest with a with a with a with an investment committee based out of London, New York, or or Pretoria, or would you rather invest with a partner that's been investing in 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 Mumbai? They're from Mumbai. They understand the niche, the sector. They're investing their capital. Your capital has been put alongside their capital with exactly the same type of returns. Which one would you prefer? And that's what I mean by by Wikipedia, where there's 19 million accredited people around the world that get to participate and update Wikipedia, but they're accredited. You and I can't participate. That's where the world is going when it comes to due diligence. And then participants, you know, 
this is the one I like probably the most, which is all around investor circles and um, and and your network and you know gamification and all of us are wanting to play against our friends and figure out you know you know the super brews of the world and this and that. But imagine if you could invest with your circles. Maybe you're competing with 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 another team or your group of friends or and and challenges, but where where people are working together, adding value together, and ultimately you would have your badges, you would you would have your network circles. And, and so it's not only about investing, but it's about connecting. And the more you connect within your community and the more you add value, the more you grow. And so where the world is going is that, and this is all about new power and old power, is that old power was all about complying and consuming. All investment companies, be they property companies, be they financial managers, be they, be they banks even, all they're really trying to do is do two things. They want to comply and they want to sell you shit. I want to be clear. They want to comply and they want to sell you stuff. New power companies, it's all about the community. It's all about sharing. It's about affiliating with the community. It's, it's cool to be part of Airbnb. It's about adapting and, and being part of the, the experience. It's about funding. It's actually being an investor in the companies that you love. It's about producing. You know, it's actually about providing products like I and Airbnb have my own houses on, on, on Airbnb. And ultimately, maybe it's even like Wikipedia. Where you're actually shaping the future. And so, as Peter Diamante says, the world's biggest opportunities, uh, sorry, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest opportunities. Now, I had the privilege of going to Singularity University, and this is the exponential university. It's, it's on the NASA campus in, in Silicon Valley. And they talk about, you know, how do you impact a billion people? And a lot of people think that we copied it from there. But it's actually not the truth. In 2013, when I was doing the research for my book, we worked out that about a billion people on the planet, currently 12.9% of the world's population, has access to property. And we actually said, well, wouldn't it be cool in our lifetime if we could double that? And if, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but if you go and search on, on Google and YouTube, you will find videos called Project Double the Wealth. And the idea was that if a billion people have access to property, why don't we double it? And what's important when it comes to exponentials is that you've got to ask yourself better questions. You know, there's a whole lot of things here that are really, really important around exponentials. But the top one here is ask yourself better questions. You know, what impact are you having? Are you a, a learning leader? Is the future for you about scarcity or abundance? What about the convergence of technologies? Everyone always thinks it's about one technology, but it's not. It's about technologies converging. It's about digitization. It's about how it starts really slowly and then starts to ex accelerate. And it's also about the individual becoming powerful. There's so much information to share. But in simple terms, Peter Diamante has put it down into six. He called it the six Ds, that when an industry is disrupted, it literally has six Ds. So the first is digitization. Then you've got deception. Then you've got disruption. Then you've got dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization. So a good example, cell phones. Before you got a smartphone, you know, you would have had to go and buy a phone, a camera, a GPS, a voice recorder, a alarm clock, a stopwatch. I could go on and on and on. Now you've got your smartphone, everything all in one place. It's free, basically. It's, it's dematerialized, democratized, and, and demonetized. Now, if you take any of the industries, if you take Uber as an example, well, Uber digitized taxis, then they went through the deceptive phase where the taxi industries are like, we don't really care about their growth, they're irrelevant. Then it started to disrupt them, where they started to block off the, um, the airports, and the rest of us all saw it on the news and we're like, hi, that's awesome, why don't I do that? And more and more, the likes of Uber are becoming dematerialized, demonetized, and democratized for all of us. So it's a very interesting framework. And if you take investment, wealth, and real estate, property, you know, I think that we at best are in this digitization phase. <coughs> I think the corona is going to start accelerating us towards the second stage of deception, but we're far from disruption in terms of mass adoption. And the second big lesson I learned at Singularity University is from a guy called Ray Kurzweil. Now I mentioned him earlier. But what I found interesting is that this guy is in Silicon Valley is known as the, the most accurate person in predicting the future of technology. He's had a 86% accuracy in picking 
the year that a technology would, would come out or disrupt. And he's got some amazing predictions uh, going forward. But the one thing that I, and I had the privilege of learning from him and Peter personally, and the one thing I took away from him is that to predict the future is not that difficult. Because what you do is you look for long-term trends and you figure out when they're going to intersect. And it's that in intersection point, which is where you need to build the solution for. And so as an example, he told the, the story of Siri, you know, Siri on your cell phone. And um, he said, the people that built Siri literally said, well, you've got global smartphone adoption, like which is racing ahead. You've got artificial intelligence, which is becoming more and more prevalent in these phones. And secondly, you've got voice recognition. Thirdly, sorry, you've got voice recognition. And if you take all three of them, they are, they are trending together. And so they built Siri and they sold it to Apple 18 months later for a couple of hundred million dollars. And that's a classic example of long-term trends intersecting. Let's look at a, at, a, at a very important moment. They call it the Netscape moment. Now, what's interesting is that before Netscape came along in, in 1995, there were 16 million users of the internet. They were, you know, they were the, traditionally the IT geeky type people that knew how to write code to each other. No one else knew how to participate because they couldn't, they couldn't talk to each other. They didn't know how to code and program. And then what happened is Netscape came along and it was a, it was a browser, which is how you would have logged on tonight. It was a browser and it was easy. And because of that, today, there are literally like 4 billion people on the internet around the world. And so what's, what's called the Netscape moment is that the internet had actually been around, some argue, as far back as the 60s. And yet it didn't get mass adoption because it wasn't easy. Please notice the word easy. And so there's a company called Amazon. And in 1995, and funnily enough, Jeff Bezos was an investment banker, so he wasn't a technologist. He just noticed these trends. And at the end of 1994, he resigned from his job and he drove across the Silicon Valley and he started Amazon because he said the internet is a trend worth backing. And he created Amazon. And what's really interesting is that if you read his books, and I highly recommend that you go and read his books, they don't try and figure out where the world is going. They actually stick to the, to the trends that don't change. So he talks about the focus being on customers. And he says customers' demands and needs don't change. They want things that are safe. They want things that are simple. They want things that are cheap. They want things that are fast. And, and that's what we've got to focus on. Secondly, it's about the long term. Don't just try and, it's not about trying to get dividends or try and please the shareholders in the next quarter. It's about the long term trends. And that's why Amazon has been so successful. The third thing is that it's neither, you know, most people are either black or white. And their attitude is it's neither, it's neither, you know, it's neither, you don't have to choose between black or white, rather make it both. And so, and they always focus back to what's best for the customers and where do we want to be long term. And then secondly, they never ever, you know, rest on their laurels because every day is day one. And that's why a company like Amazon has been so innovative and today is the, the, the world's wealthiest company. The other thing Jeff Bezos said is you must be willing to fail. Most of us have been brought up in an environment where we think failing is the worst thing ever. But if you want to be someone that is going to change the world or participate in a project or go out there and live your dream, you're going to fail. And the metaphor I always give to people is none of you learn to walk by reading a book, not one of you. Every single one of you that learned to walk stood up and fell down, stood up and fell down. And only by standing up and falling down did you eventually learn to walk and then run. And that's exactly what he is trying to say. The second thing is you need to be willing to think long term. This is going to come over and over and over and over again. You don't have to worry about what is happening with Corona and all the headlines I showed you. You have to think about where is the world going in the next five to 10 years and how do I participate? And are things like Corona going to speed it up towards that world or is it going to slow it down? Because that's actually all that counts. And the third thing is you have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. And this is the one I laugh at because you know, I've been talking about technology for, for a long time and I think people think that I'm crazy and that I change my tune all over, but I'm actually a really simple guy. All I care about is property, technology and business and how the three are being interacted and how they are changing over time and the long-term trends. But I've had to get very, very used to being misunderstood because people always live in the present and it seems to be amazing to me that they can't see where the world is going. 
And that's why I'm trying to invite people on this journey to say, this is where the world is going. Let's prepare for it. Let's plan for it. Let's provide a solution for it rather than react and have something like a coronavirus and be stuck in the old world with no solutions. Now, from a monetary perspective, by following these long-term trends, if you'd invested $10,000 in Amazon pre-IPO, today it'd be worth $12 million. And what's also interesting is that if you'd invested in the crash, because remember the IPO was in 1997, so you had the dot-com boom and bust, and the Amazon share price went from $76 to $6. <coughs> and so while everyone else was running away, and by the way, Jeff Bezos never sold any of his shares, you, you, people actually invested. And what's really interesting is if you look, for many years, the Amazon share price went sideways. But those people that believed in the long-term future, do you know that if you invested $10,000 at the time of the dot-com bust, today it'd be worth $152 million. So sometimes chaos is your best friend. And the thing that I find most interesting is that the dot-com boom bust creates, created chaos for Amazon as well. And it forced them to change into a platform business. And it was changing into a platform business that ultimately they've built the value of the company that they've got today. It's all about the platform. There's another story which I did a webinar uh, yesterday with our Chinese team. And it's just phenomenal what's going on in China. And I highly recommend a video. And maybe, Lee, you could post it for people called New Money. And it's just amazing what you can learn in China and, and the growth of technology and the middle class and everything else. And a company many people have heard of called Naspass actually invested $32 million for 46% for of a company uh, back in 2001. So again, right in the middle of the dot-com boom bust. And today, you know, that company, that amount is worth $120 billion. And again, if you invested $10,000 right alongside um, Naspass, it would be worth just short of $60 million today. This is an example of long-term trends. Uh, SoftBank uh, did the same thing with Alibaba. And so you need to be able to look into the future. So let me share with you some trends that I think are, are very important and we as a company, I believe, are very important. There's eight technology trends that, that I think are critically important for you to understand. The first is blockchain. And I'm going to go through these all in, in a little bit more detail. The second is artificial intelligence. The third is big data, algorithms, and quantum computing. The fourth is VR and, or, or virtual reality and augmented reality. The fifth is O2O. The sixth is mobile phone adoption. The seventh is 3D printing. And the eighth is digital layer. So let's start off with blockchain. And I've got a great video for you on blockchain because I tried to explain blockchain to people and, and they thought I was absolutely crazy. Now, what's really interesting for me when it comes to blockchain is that um, when I first heard about blockchain back in 2013, 2014, our number one challenge in terms of helping people invest was trust. And when I understood blockchain, you've got e-commerce and social media coming together and forming social commerce. But social commerce is only going to thrive on blockchain because blockchain is creating the foundation of trust for social commerce. And when I understood it back in 2013, 2014, we went at it full steam ahead because this is the future. And there's many people that say, that if you think the internet's affected your life a lot in the last 20 years, wait to see how blockchain is going to impact your life in the next 20 years. Let's watch the little video. And if you've seen it before, enjoy it because it's really interesting to listen to. This is the seller. This is the buyer. This is the middleman. Cutting out the middleman can be a great thing, unless you're the middleman. And there are a lot of middlemen or intermediaries out there. Entire industries, such as payments or securities clearing, have evolved to rely on them. Why? Because they establish trust where there is none. They establish ownership, that the seller has the right to sell what's being sold. They attest to history, that there is a clean transaction history and they certify ability that the buyer has the money to buy it. All pretty critical details when you don't know the person on the other side of the transaction. Intermediaries know and trust one another. Their business is based on it, so they have more to lose than gain from breaching that trust. But what if there were a better, cheaper middleman? One that didn't add as much cost, complexity, and chance for error? There might be. 
It's called blockchain, and it has the potential to disrupt the entire ecology of intermediaries. It's a distributed ledger that relies on large networks of computers that redundantly encode transaction data by solving complex mathematical equations. The secure ledger provides an inviolable record. If the history of an instrument is incorruptible and available to all parties, there's no need for a third party to vouch. Blockchain is proof of ownership, history, and ability in non-centralized encrypted form. It's fast, transparent, and free of error. The question is not whether blockchains can cut out the middlemen in complex transactions, but rather which middlemen and when. I always find that uh, that statement brilliant, which is uh, <laughs> blockchain. It's it's not a case of if they're going to cut out the middlemen. It's just a case of when, and which which you know which middlemen. And if you're a middleman, you know it's something to really consider. You know, in the property industry, there are 16 different middlemen, and to buy a house in South Africa it takes about three months. In England, it's three months. Uh, in Australia, it's three months. In America, it's quite a lot quicker. It can be anywhere from a week to, to four weeks but imagine if you could do it on the blockchain which they are now really starting to 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 do and you can do it in in seconds or even minutes and and cut out all the middlemen and imagine if you could do it through your cell phone and not have to pay a huge exorbitant um estate agent fees and lawyers fees and conveyancing fees people think that i'm crazy wait and see so Let's, uh, so blockchain for me is, is, is a critical one. Let's move to the second one. And uh, sorry, just before we do, um, there's a, there was an article in uh, Inc. Magazine about the nine industries which are going to be most disrupted by blockchain. And when you look at it, it's the most inefficient and archaic you know, industries in the world. And the first one's banking and the second one's real estate. And you know, it's, it's pretty much a no-brainer because they both need a huge amount of trust, which was explained in that video. There's a huge amount of middlemen trying to shovel paper between each other, and blockchain literally solves that problem in terms of where the world is going. The second one is AI. I've already spoken about artificial intelligence and Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is actually the father of uh, artificial intelligence or the grandfather of artificial intelligence. He runs artificial intelligence for Google, just to put it in perspective. And he's the guy I was speaking about earlier with the long-term trends. And he reckons that AI by 2029 will reach human levels and that by 2045 would have multiplied the intelligence of the human biological machine of our civilization a billion fold. Now, whether we like it or not, this is coming. You know, people are devastated. Oh, we're all going to lose our jobs. Robots are going to run our lives, blah, blah, blah. Maybe. I'm happy to have a Q&A at the end if you want to discuss it later. But it's coming. And all of you are using uh, AI already, whether you know it or not. You know, um, my wife said to me uh, the other day, um, it's amazing. She went online to buy something. I can't remember what it was. And then suddenly all over Facebook and Google and were, were ads for, this, for the type of product she was buying. That's artificial intelligence. And it's the same with your phone. It knows where you're going, everything. There's, you will actually be amazed how much artificial intelligence is already in your life and making your life a lot easier. You know, it's not all negative. It's, it's making your life a hell of a lot easier. The third one is big data. And, you know, We've got, we've got simple tests uh, like the investor test because ultimately imagine if you could take the personality tests, whether it's Roger Hamilton's wealth creator test, Richard Neff's personal driving dynamics test, um, our investor test, bring all that information together. These systems all exist already in big data. And then you put it into algorithms like GITS, the global investment due diligence system. You take all the fundamentals of property and macro and microeconomic analysis long-term trends around currency and everything else. And I mean, I could do two hours just on the slide. And ultimately it comes together and it helps you and I that have access to a mobile phone make the right investments for ourselves, personalized right investments. So, you know, we, I want to retire, you know, say in 10 years, I'm just making it up and I want to have X amount of passive income and I put it all in the calculator. And basically every investment I look at, it looks backwards at all the algorithms and the big data. And if you extrapolate back for long enough, you can future-proof forward. That's the way all the big uh, investors and systems work. 
And it's not 100% accurate, but it's a hell of a lot better than your gut feel or your financial advisor telling you what they would like to tell you so they can earn the most fees. And ultimately, it helps you predict what is the best investment for you in a personalized way to get you to your results. That's where the world is going. The third is B, uh, fourth is VR and AR. So virtual reality is where you stick a, a mask on your head and you can pretty much go anywhere now. Um, I believe actually the more important one is AR, which is augmented reality, which is where through your cell phone or through Google Glasses, you can actually see things. Now, I had a surreal experience happen about a month ago. It was during lockdown and uh, my, my son suddenly uh, got sent this thing by his teacher where you can literally go to Google now and there's about 18 animals including a uh, tiger, lion, um, crocodile, uh, eagle, etc., And you can literally um, click, on, click on Google. You'll see it come up and it says Google picture. And in your room, it puts an alligator. So like there's been a whole bunch of people in Nisner saying they've sent a thing of a shark. And I keep replying and saying, yeah, because there's no boats, the wildlife are even coming out of the lagoon. And I mean, this is a picture of a, uh, you know, an alligator. Well, I tell people it's a crocodile, but it's actually an alligator. You know, there's a picture of my son with a tiger. That's him playing with a lion. And, and you know, let's be frank, the, the tiger doesn't look very lifelike. But, I mean, if an eight-year-old, he's eight, um, playing on his cell phone, is doing this, where do you think the world is going? You know, do you think they're going to need to fly over to England or America to view property before they buy it? What's interesting in the lockdown is that I'm meeting estate agents. Most estate agents are in complete disarray. I mean, estate agents that are doing virtual tours, selling online. And they're actually thriving because everyone else is out of business. O2O is, is where it goes online to offline, or sometimes even the other way around, offline to online. And what's really interesting is that the biggest uh, VC fund, venture capital fund in the world, <coughs> is investing specifically in this space. So they're in ARM, which is Alibaba. So that helps physical businesses sell online. They're in, uh, they're in uh, Uber, which, which you know, it helps us that are online have a physical experience of being transported. Um, they're in WeWork, which is uh, collaboration. What's interesting is, is you know, I, I believe that co-working is actually going to explode again after Corona. Um, and the reason being is that I think more and more people, a, a survey that was done said 70% of people that work have, are from working from home have said they, that after Corona, they would like to continue some form of working from home. But I also think that a majority of people don't want to work there full time because it's lonely. Um, they want to be around other people and, 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 you know, they also sometimes want to get out of the house, et cetera. But what's important is they don't necessarily need a full-time office. The a big company certainly won't waste all that space. Co-working will absolutely thrive, um, although it's taking a bit of a hiding right now. And um, what's fascinating for me is that if you take that venture capital company, um, the Vision Fund, now remember they invested in Alibaba. Right in the beginning, they put $20 million into Alibaba that's worth over $100 billion today. And they are going after the real estate industry uh, because of how old and archaic it is in this whole O2O space. And then this one's probably quite obvious for people, but, but I don't think people realize how important it is, is mobile adoption. You know, one of the things that's interesting in Africa, in China, in India, is that we didn't have big telephone systems. And so what tends to happen is technology uh, leapfrogs upon itself. And it's happening with mobile phone adoption. In Africa already, there's 70% uh, mobile phone uh, penetration. And what I find fascinating is everyone you look at, look at them. They have smartphones. They don't just have old phones anymore. People want smartphones, which gives them access to the internet and access to learning, to education, etc. Now, somewhere between 2022 and 2025, the whole world will have access to the internet. And that's going to bring, uh, there's about 4 billion people that are currently online. Is going to bring another 4 billion people into the global economy. That's The global economy is going to double, just to put that in perspective. And it's all going to happen in the digital environment. So if you're not providing a service online that is solving their problems and, 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 and providing solutions to their needs, then you're not going to be part of the future. This one's quite interesting, and I'll show you a quick video. It's about digital printing. And um, if you look here quickly, this uh, house is being digital printed. We had, a, we had a, a, a webinar on Monday night about the South African uh, property market and, and, and someone was saying that affordable housing is, is just, you can't build it proper, profitably, yet there's this massive need. And, um, and, so, and they were asking about digital printing. And I mean, this, this is where the world is going.
So it just gives you a window into the future. And just by the way, in terms of all the logistics lines and all the problems that we've had in now with China and being able to move stuff logistically around the world, you know, I think the digital printing, not just of property, but it's going to become more and more a reality where there'll be just in time digital printing literally in your location uh, from a manufacturing perspective. And then the last thing is the digital layer. And this is where it all comes together. It's actually with beams and sensors. And, you know, we talk about smart TVs, smart watches, smart telephones, uh, smart fridges, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And everything's getting smarter and smarter. And it's because of all um, the technology that's in all the systems. And, and, and there's all these little, uh, uh, I forgot the name now, micro uh, microchips that are in all, in all our systems, and including they're going to be in our body one day, whether people like them or not, it's a fact. And it brings it all together in the digital layer, and there's going to be billions and billions of these all over the place, and that's going to allow us and bring it all together um, in terms of the digital environment. And it's happening. I mean, again, go and watch that video, New Money, that I spoke about in China, where everything's connected and, uh, and how efficiently it actually runs uh, in terms of where the world's going. So those are the eight technology trends. Let's look at the eight social trends. You've got social commerce and collaborative investing. You've got the rise of the middle class. You've got globalization. You've got blockchain and cryptocurrencies. You've got social pressure to democratize access to wealth. You've got gamification. You've got personalization. And you've got investors wanting to have a purposeful impact. So the first one is social commerce and collaborative investing. Now, I highly recommend going to my LinkedIn profile and reading all about this. And because collaborative investing has been around for centuries. And it was pretty much done traditionally by the kings and queens. There's five principles to collaborative investing. And the only people that were able to do it were people with a hell of a lot of money. And, and so, and there's five principles and those underlying principles of investing have not changed. And they are extremely sound fundamentals to investing. Why did most of us not do it? Well, we just didn't have the money or the resources to be able to do it. And that's why we talk about collaborative smart investing. Because ultimately, you've got social commerce. I've told you already, e-commerce and social media coming together is social commerce. You've got collaborative investing. But just like you've got a smart TV and a smart watch and a smart phone, why can you not have smart investing? And that's what this whole article is about, taking into account global trends that are happening across production, commerce, compliance, regulation, and trust, and some of the brands that people uh, can, can recognize. Now, Really, what, what's interesting in collaborative smart investing is it is the ethos behind Wealth 5.0 and where the world is going. And again, I find it fascinating because we've been talking about this for a long time, and now Corona is just speeding up this adoption massively. The second thing is the rise of the middle class, and more and more people are moving to the cities. But there's three things we look for. A large population, uh, urbanization of that population, and internet adoption. If you look for those three things, you basically have a rising middle class. Now, in China, 400 million people joined the Chinese middle class um, in the last 30 years, and that is why the economy has boomed from virtually nowhere to the second biggest economy in the world and arguably on track very quickly to become the biggest economy in the world. Now, there are 1.2 billion people joining the middle class over the next 10 years, and we've got the opportunity, all of us, through digital solutions to provide opportunities to that rising middle class. They've all got the exact same needs. They want access to education, they want access to health, and they want access to wealth. The third thing is globalization and capital flows. What you tend to find is that there's large capital flows from the emerging markets into the first world markets from a safety perspective. And yet at the moment, it's been the, the top 1% of the top 1%, still the wealthiest people. What I find fascinating is in China as a, alone, there's 800 million people that are on Ali, uh, sorry, not Ali, uh, um, WeChat. Um, which is the like a WhatsApp service that they've got in China. You can invest uh, through WeChat, and legally they can invest, you know, up to up to fifty thousand dollars. And um, what's interesting is that Ken was talking just yesterday, is that they're looking to relax regulation over the next two to five years. Can you imagine the average Chinese person that goes through the airports in in uh, uh, not what do they call it duty free? The average Chinese person spends four times more than any other nationality in duty free. Um, they, they, they constitute 42% of the world's online purchases, which is bigger than England, um, you know, Germany, and, and like the whole of Europe all put together. And uh, imagine um, like being able to invest online as well when that middle class has access. Blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So, cryptocurrencies had a very much a 
they call it the Gartner hype curve. It went up, it went down. Most of you probably bought cryptocurrencies in 2017. I did um, as well, um, although not quite 2017. I bought earlier than that, and I've never sold them because I don't believe in the hype. I believe in the long term of where blockchain's going and and where Bitcoin is going. And if you look here, the the hype cycle is very much alive and well, and we're probably sitting very much in this part of the hype cycle. But the investment in blockchain continues to increase dramatically. And if you're part of our inner circle, I'd highly recommend that you're on our, our crypto blockchain group because I shared some amazing articles and, and different members share amazing articles around where the world is going. And I, I shared stuff just tonight. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky to be invited to some of the, the global think tanks in terms of where the world's going. And it's amazing how big business and governments are behind this, whether they talk about it privately or publicly. The fifth is social pressure. You know, the UN actually went out and they, they asked people around the world, what are the top things that we need to solve? And they came up with 17 challenges. They call them the sustainable development goals. And what's interesting is that number one, the number one thing that the world wants to solve is poverty. And so as Peter Diamante says, you know, if you want to make a lot of money, solve a grand challenge. Well, why don't we just solve the grandest challenge on the planet? The sixth one is gamification. This one's an interesting one. Everyone looked at me and said, yeah, but it's never going to happen. Well, my son is at home at the moment learning online along with every other student almost in the world. And whether we like it or not, it's happening. And my son is not going to sit. He's eight. He's not going to sit on a Zoom call for six, seven, eight hours. It's not going to happen. The only way that you're going to get the best out of him is gamification. And the benefits of gamification are instant feedback, better learning environment, prompting a behavioral change, uh, can be applied uh, to most of the learning, learning needs and it impacts the bottom line and just a general learning experience. So again, coronavirus <coughs> is forcing this to happen whether, whether teachers and the education system both at school and at university like it. But what's more interesting in terms of online learning where most of us now realize that you've got to be learning all the time and it's something like, a, 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 I can't even remember the number, if it was a million or a billion dollars I spend every single day in terms of online learning. It's one of the fastest growing uh, curves in the world. The seventh is personalization. None of us actually like being told what to do. This is your box and don't sit in it. I, I certainly hate you know, lockdown because it feels like someone else is telling me what to do. We all want to have personalization. We all want our journey. We, we want to be on our personal journey. And you know the research is overwhelming where if you've given a personal journey, you're much more connected with that brand and with that experience. And that's why I like Netflix, because it tells me what to watch next. So I like Amazon, because it tells me what to buy next based on my needs. Not your needs, my needs. And that's exactly what you want in, in your investing. And the last one is, is uh, purposeful impact. And what's so interesting is that a lot of people thought this was the, just the greenies and the people that wanted to hug trees, but it's actually become a really important part of business. You know, By 2020, it's going to be a trillion dollar industry. And as Richard Branson says, it's not just, you know, good, it's good for business. And so if you bring all of these together, you know, we're in a stage of no ordinary disruption. Now, quite frankly, I saw a slide interesting enough where we first used the slide in China in 2015. Uh, my, one of my partners, Paul Nierer, uh, put it up. Uh, because you've got technology and you've got social cultural disruption all coming together. And all 16 of these trends are intersecting. And this is where the generational opportunity lies. Because over the next 10 years, all 16 of these are going to be intersecting. And if you're providing solutions to people's problems, this is where there's a generational business opportunity. Now, when I mean generational, in 1440, Gutenberg came out with the printing press and it completely democratized access to knowledge because before that, only the churches and the monarchs had access to books. But when Gutenberg gave them the printing press in the 1440s, the middle class and everyone else had access to knowledge. In 1910, Henry Ford came out with the, with the Motor T, uh, Model T uh, car. Before that, cars were only available to the extremely wealthy. They were toys. In fact, people used to drive you know, a car and there'd be people in the front. I mean, they were toys. And then in 1910, Henry Ford came out with the Model T, the affordable car for the middle class. It changed the landscape of American history. It changed the economy of the 20th century and it changed the world economy because it gave democratization to the middle class. And my guesstimation is that this decade will be one of the most important decades in human history when through technology, we democratized access to investment, to wealth, to real estate. And that's why I gave you the slide in terms of what is happening. And, and coronavirus is, is just going to force 
this adoption curve. And that's why in our ecosystem, we built an ecosystem that wasn't just about investing. Wealth Migrate is about investing for, for, for middle class, high net worth and ultra high net worth investors. Wealth University was a digital online learning environment. You know, the wealth movement is, I fundamentally believe, even more so now after lockdown, that people are going to want to get together and have physical experiences. And wealth create is ultimately, you know, someone that's investing $1 and someone that's investing a million dollars will want a different experience. We've got an ecosystem where we can drive people and, and provide value depending on their level of sophistication and their level of knowledge. And it's really important because this is all about personalization. And in simple terms, what we wanted to do is make investing easy. You know, what used to take months or years can now be done in minutes. And, you know, we're super excited with the launch of our digital wallets where people can now literally participate from $100. And so, you know, no longer are you stuck to one property or one investment in one country and one asset class. You get access to multiple qualified partners in multiple countries, you know, whether it's a medical building, a residential building, or even a big five, a game reserve. You, you get access uh, to these opportunities. And these are just some of the opportunities we've helped people invest in over the last six years, medical buildings in America, residential buildings in London, industrial buildings in Australia, uh, and developments in South Africa. And so whether it's America, England, Australia, or even South Africa, you no longer need to choose. And, and what's really interesting is that the model's actually pretty simple. We don't go out and find the properties ourselves. We go out and find the partners. So as an example, Crestwood, is a lady for the last 10 years that's been helping primarily South Africans actually invest in buy to let properties in London. She helps them find them, renovate them, manage them, and even sell them. And so we believe she's got a stellar track record. You know, she then puts a the property on the platform. You and I have access to those properties. And there's literally four simple steps. We sign up, we select the investment. We are not a financial advisor. We do not give you financial advice. We give people the information for them to make the right decisions for themselves. They then transact online and then they manage the entire global portfolio in one place. And it's really interesting. We had a building um, transfer in England, in London, about a week or two ago. I can't remember how long ago it was. And it was so interesting the feedback from investors. They were like, I never dreamed of thinking I would own a building in London. Um, and, and now they do. And so who's our typical type investor? Well, you know, I met this uh, gentleman many years ago in London. He was an entrepreneur. He was looking for something that was easy and simple. He wanted it to be safe. He didn't want the hassle of lawyers, bank accounts, structures, and, and just all the complication. You know, he wanted to be in control and make his own decisions. He wanted diversification. There's a great video that I highly recommend. And maybe, Lee, you could put the, the inner circle video I put out on, on Ray Dalio. The number one thing that you need to do during these economic times is diversification. Okay, Ray Dalio is one of the wealthiest men in the world and one of the most successful investors over the last 40 years. And he teaches you how to have diversification. And I did a video on it. You want variety. You, you have to pay transaction fees. You know, when you catch an Uber or an Airbnb, you have to pay a transaction fee. But you're not happy to pay AUM, which is assets under management. And, and the, the, the metaphor I like to use is that at Airbnb, when I give them my house and put it on the platform, when they rent it out for me, they charge me 3%. So if I rent it out for 1,000 rand a night, I get, or $100 a night, I get, $97 back, okay? And I know that it's easy, it's clean, it's transparent. But what Airbnb don't do, which is what the financial industry do do with an AUM, is that they charge you a fee every month, whether they're renting out your property or not. And that's the difference. Airbnb only make money when you make money. You want it to be automated and mobile, and you want it to be online. So let's look at an experience in real life. This is Lyndon literally you know, logging into his uh, platform. And he decides to go and look at some deals and starts to go through the marketplace. But he decides, hang on, just before I go through the marketplace, I'd actually like to go back and I'd look, like to look at my wallet. You know, I'd like to see what I'm dealing with in my wallet. You can see he's got $64,000 in his wallet. He goes through and he looks at all his different deals and uh, the type of returns and when he's getting paid. You can see he's got about $15,000 in his wallet. So he decides, right, I'm going to go and invest. So he decides he wants to invest in a medical building in Texas. He goes and looks at it, he reads through all the information, the overview, the market summary, the investment summary. He goes and reads about the sponsor who's the partner on the ground. He reads all about the due diligence and what's being done. He goes up to the top right corner, 
where you can see all the financial information in one place. You can see the type of risk category, so banks not hidden on page 32. You can download all the documentation. You can see the milestones. It decides, right, this is a project that I'd like to participate in. He literally goes in, he can put in the amount of money that he would like to invest. In this case, he said $5,000. You can see all the fees completely transparently. He can digitally sign all the different documents. He can download the digital documents that he signed. Obviously, he's read everything. And it gives him all the banking details. Um, in, in our new model, you can actually pre-fund your wallet as well. And so it's actually all done. And you can actually go in and in less than two minutes, you watch uh, Linden invest in a commercial medical building in America. Now, when you look at that simplicity, that's why we've got members in 133 countries. We've done over $600 million through the platform. We've had $100 million actually invested by clients that have been paid out over $12 million in dividends. You know, we won numerous different awards, but probably the one we're proudest of is we've got a higher than 78% reinvestment rate. And we believe that's only going to continue to increase with the launch of the digital wallets. By the way, the launch of the digital wallets, we're the first platform in the world to have a globally compliant solution with a global digital wallet in terms of investing um, in the space, property, et cetera. You, you can't do it anywhere else. There's not another one. And you know, would you like to have your money in a global digital wallet protected by European law and backed by five of the top banks in the world? You know, that, that's, that's what we've offered. So that's what uh, members in 133 countries look like. And as I said, you know, when we started, we started with 100,000 minimum investment, then 10,000, then 1,000. And we're super, super excited now that we beat it testing $100. And we're well on our way to our dream to get it to $1 per person per investment. That's what the investor landscape looks like. There's many, many platforms that are out there, but we're the only global platform. And like I said to you already, with global regulation and, and a global wallet. And so we don't actually see them as compet competitors, we see them as collaborators. Let's look at the business model. Well, in simple terms, we built the platform, Wealth Migrate. On the right-hand side, you've got multiple different ways of demand. You've got business to consumer, B2C, you've got business to business, B2B, and you've got business to platform, B2P. And on the left-hand side, you've got all the different supply. So let's start off with the demand side, just so that you understand what is built and you can actually understand the business applications which are here. I've already explained to you Lyndon, so he would be a B2C customer and he comes in and he uses the platform. If you take this, this is an affiliate. So this company is Cypriot Realty, they've got about 10,000 clients, they help people invest into Cyprus and using a completely wide labeled solution with all the look and feel of their colors, she can now go to her clients and she can offer them opportunities in England, Australia, America. She's providing more value to her clients with a complete look and feel of her colors and her branding, and she's creating more income streams for her business. Now, what's fascinating for us is that, you know, four weeks ago or a month ago, we'd be reaching out to people and saying, hey, why don't you do this? It's, you know, more, more income streams for your business, more value for your clients, and people come back to us and going, yeah, but I'm busy. It's amazing how many of them are phoning us right now because their current business models uh, don't, are not working. Um, you know, there's a company called Easy Equities, they're the biggest stockbroker in South Africa. They wanting to launch easy properties. We literally showed them how in less than two hours we could give them a fully functioning global solution um, with, with the platform. You can also go up to genres. Uh, women and wealth is one of them. Just by the way, for the women that are online, we believe that the women segment, helping women invest, is one of the biggest growth opportunities in the next 10 years. And it's another one of those generational opportunities. In fact, I probably should add that to one of the eight trends because it's it's massive, massive, massive. And, um, and, and we're witnessing it in China and in India and in Africa. And, and you know, we can, we, we can literally have it, something that Bill Lundestead is very passionate about, where we can literally solve and talk to women and women, you know, women talking to women in women's language and solving their problems. And traditionally investing has been a very male dominated chauvinistic industry and it's changing fast. There's a way to do it for millennials where you get focused on millennials. And just today, actually, and we've got a meeting tomorrow with the opportunity of even providing a vertical for Sharia compliant um, opportunities for, you know, the, there's a massive uh, segment of investors around the world um, in the Muslim communities, et cetera, that want Sharia compliant. And then the last part in the B2C is that you need to marry together both education and investment. You know, there's plenty of online investments. 
And that's had large adoption, as I've already said, and even larger now in the last four to five weeks. But online investing has had large growth, but not, not large adoption yet. And the reason being is trust, like we've already spoken about. And the way to solve that is to bring together both education and, and investing. And so when we built the global real estate marketplace, we, we see it as having different legs. We've already built the investment leg. And then in the end of 2018, we started to build out the education space. And one of the most successful in the world is a guy called Grant Cardone, who, who literally helps people raise, you can see, uh, $270 million in one week. And we went back and we, we reverse engineered the whole process. We looked at how he was doing it between his digital marketing, his books, his courses, his live courses, his online courses, his cheap products. And ultimately, that's all about digital marketing on the front end, bringing people in, and then ultimately helping them invest in, plat in platforms. And a lot of credit needs to go to a guy called Neil Milan. We worked really hard with Neil Milan, and he explained to me, he said, Scott, listen, you're giving away all your education for free. It's ridiculous. You need to be able to help people get in on the front. You can monetize the digital education. They get value out of it, and then ultimately, they become investors. And so he helped us get a guy called um, Aubrey, called a performance marketer and it really changed the rules of the game for us he came from a company called get smarter that um, has done a revenue of over a hundred million dollars um, this year um, they sold for 120 million dollars a couple of years ago uh, to a listed company in new york and i wanted to share with you the science behind this because when it comes to investing most people think that marketing you know they often say marketing you know 50 percent of the money i spent worked and 50 percent of the money i spent didn't work i'm just not sure which 50 percent but actually in digital, it's mathematical. They call it test, measure, predict, scale. So these are our customer journeys where you map it all out. You then go and actually track it in a, in a system. And you can literally say, like, if I invest, what are the different returns? And how long will it take me to get my money back? So if you invest $1, you want to make $4 back. You can actually come back. And so for our shareholders, they say, well, do you want to pay me a dividend? Or do you want me to, or, or I ask them, do you want me to pay you a dividend? Or do you want me to reinvest? you know, the money into growing the company because because companies like Amazon just and Alibaba just reinvested back in the company. And a 10% will show you the growth in the company, 15%, you know, 20%, you know, 25%, et cetera. So you, you're not guessing, like you can literally see, you know, what the difference is and, and you can you can compare scenarios. So, you know, what I love is that it's, it's all predictable. And the more predictable it is, the more value you've got in your company. And the more predictable it is, the more you can scale. And so why are we talking um, to investors and what we're doing is because it's all about scaling now and, and, and growth capital to, to be able to actually scale the business. And, and what's beautiful is, is that the digital marketing uh, provides you with, with all the predictability. So just some of the products that we put together was our inner circle because we realized that people you know, wanted education, they wanted investment, they wanted community, and they wanted purpose you know, all in one place. And we built the eWealth Pack, which is an online you know, learning pack we built the investor test, which, you know, again, tonight you've heard me talk about algorithms and personalization. People actually do the test that you can't pass or fail it, but it's where you are on your journey. It then gives you a personalized journey. We've got the, the micro degree and the eight steps to wealth for, for beginners and, and, and really setting yourself up. We've got the wealth GPS for intermediate to advanced that want to go international. And we've also created what we realized is that it was really important to have wealth consultants. And so we've got human beings. We, we tend to say to people, we want to be a global digital platform, but with a human heart. And so we've got, we've got people that can be there to hold your hand. I know certainly I hate phoning a call center. I want to deal with my private banker and, and this is the experience. And then the last thing we did was create a starter pack, which really just made it easy for people. They could start, you know, it becomes black or white. Do you want to start? Yes or no. And they get access to everything I just said. And it all starts from $197. And what, what's truly exciting is that now people can literally get started. You, you can get started if you want to invest in, you know, from $197. The other thing that this unlocked for us was our affiliate partners because there's global affiliates we work with. As an example, this group is called I Chang Tao in China. They've given us 150 clients. And when there's digital products, it enables them to go out to add value to their entire global community and to track it. And so whether it's them, or whether it's money revealed, there were two million people there. Um, you know, my wealth, um, Ann Wilson. We've got an event with her this weekend. So you can see there's multiple ways to scale here. And actually, the fastest way to scale is the same as Amazon, where you where it's about strategic partnerships 
working with other businesses that are adding value to them. On the supply side, it's equally the same, B2B and B2P. And so you've got a company like Infinity, they did a, a launch where they raised $24 million for a $76 million deal, primarily from very ultra high net worth investors. In fact, you had to invest a million dollars and or institutions. You have companies like Orvest that specialize specifically in medical buildings uh, in America. And both of those products are on our platform. People can go in, they can see the different products that are available. They can literally click on it and, and participate and, and invest in the deals. The other thing that happens on the supply side is that we get developers or, or investment companies that come along and they say, listen, we don't want to show people other people's deals. And so like as an example, this was a property developer in England. We literally completely wide labeled it for him. We only put his two deals on the platform. He had his property, he had his clients. They came in, they saw his branding, and he literally went in and, and funded both these deals. And I mean, we love these type of deals because they've already got the supply and the demand, and we're providing the transaction engine. And then the last thing is that we learned from the Cedars campaign is that how to launch a digital campaign. You know, most people have no idea how to launch digitally. And we learned it with Cedars because we raised all this capital from people all over the world without one face-to-face -face meeting. And there's a whole process. And so we take all of our clients, <coughs> all of our suppliers through this process of how to do a digital launch. And the last thing is, is that there's platforms like CrowdStreet, that's one of the more successful platforms in America, but you can't invest there unless you're an American citizen. And we can actually plug and play uh, directly into them. So it really comes into our Rockefeller strategy, which is all about, you know, Rockefeller ended up owning 90% of the distribution of oil. And the reason being is that they did it through mergers, acquisitions, and strategic partnerships. You know, when we went into China, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning in China. And we realized that it's really hard to go to China to find people to set up your own teams, et cetera. Now, to be clear to, to China, those hard lessons have paid off. And we literally did a webinar yesterday uh, for people that were interested in investing directly in China because the team there has just got phenomenal growth over the last uh, two to three years. They've um, actually, if you look at the, the, the funds raised per project or even the equity deal value, they, they increased their equity raise last year by 5x. So 500% and they increased their investors by 200%. And this year they're looking to again, uh, two to three X their growth again. So really interesting what our, what our team on China is doing. But when we went to India, we said, listen, we don't need to do it all ourselves. Let's go and find a company that is on the ground like Property Share. They're helping local Indians invest in local deals. We can help global people invest in Indian deals and we can help Indian investors invest in global deals. And then on the demand side, there was a company called Sherios, where they've got 15 million women entrepreneurs, and they were looking for Sherios wealth, and we can provide them with a solution. So what's important when you look at a case study is that we were very, very lucky that we got a gentleman called Gavin Rousseau involved. He's a professional cyclist. He was actually SA Champs three times, and he was at a company called Aprio. And most of you haven't heard of them, but they do the interbanking. Um, on all the big bank systems. They, it's a marketplace, it's a fintech company that, that moves about $13 trillion a year. And what I realized, uh, luckily by fluke, was when I hired him, I thought I was hiring a, a CTO, like a, like a programmer, but I was actually hiring a tech team builder. And what they've built is a book building system. And so he joined us because he wanted to be able to invest in New York. He thought it was a cool idea to invest in New York property from $1,000. Uh, he started as our CTO and is now actually our COO. And what a book building system is in simple terms is that on the one hand, you've got supply. On the other hand, you've got demand. But you equally need to have compliance, operations, and digital. And what we've realized is that every single one of our partners, either on supply or demand, doesn't have all the different pieces of the puzzle. And so we provide them with a solution. And a classic example was, was a company called Cashbox. They came to us and they said, look, we've got supply. We've got a product. We only deal with high net worth investors. And so we provided them with compliance operations and digital. We, we gave them a platform. We created an alternative investment platform. We created a marketplace. And so whether you're a, a property educator or financial educator, we can provide you a solution. Whether you're an estate agent, we can provide you with a solution. Whether you're a financial manager or, or an asset manager, we can provide you a solution. And even if you're an institution like Investec, you know, a, a financial bank, we can provide you with a solution. We actually showed Investec 
how we can literally put it together uh, in a wide label solution that can log in completely with Investex colors into the marketplace. And even if you're a platform like Easy Properties, we can provide you a solution. I'm not showing any of you, anything that is going to be built. I'm showing you what is already built. And then the dream is, is how do we empower a billion people? And we always knew that we were going to be starting out with high net worth individuals, eventually move to the middle class, and then ultimately move to everyone. And that's where Wealth Create came in. Our vision is to make investing as simple as a swipe of a finger and ultimately to get it down to, to $1. And, you know, ironically, with our digital wallets, we're just that much closer. What drives us and what our purpose is the wealth movement. How do we create a better and more sustainable planet for all? You know, when you look at the top 1%, they own more than 50% of the world's wealth, and they get wealthier every single year. And the reason is, is because they invest in better quality assets. Where you live in the world has a dramatic impact on, on your wealth. Whether you're a male or a female has a dramatic impact on your wealth. You know, when you were born has a dramatic impact on your wealth. And as investors, we all have massive problems. We tend to be stuck in country. We don't have access to deals. And the complexity of tax and structuring is, is just too much. And so what we wanted to do, and I've told you the stats already, 49% of the world's wealth is held in property. 12.9% of the world's you know, population actually has access to that property. Of that 12.9%, you and I, Less than 1% of people are going to retire wealthy. And using technology, we want to help the 99% to be able to invest like the top 1%. And as we say to people, our social promise and, and what was written, a manifesto written by Hilda Landestead, is that imagine a world, a world where most of all people are literate, a world where education is par for the course, a world where women are treated as equals, a world where all people have access to investment opportunities. Imagine a world where 6 billion people on the planet who currently live in poverty can live a better life. Imagine that world. At the wealth movement, we're aiming to create that world. And as we joke with people, why could we not create the Amazon of real estate? So I want to share with you, we've spoken tonight a lot about trends. Just wait, I need some water, please. And let's look at another major trend which was when we had the digitization of the stock market. They call it the Big Bang. Do you know that in 1965, the average stock was held for six years, and today it's held for just 22 seconds. The reason being is that a company called E-Trade came along in the early 80s, and they democratized access to the stock market. Now, today, there's plenty of those platforms. There's Robinhood, there's, there's Easy Equities in South Africa, et cetera. But ultimately, you know, it, it's, I mean, this is a $14 billion business and a, and, and a massive industry around the world where everyone has access to invest in the stock market now, not just the wealthiest. And yet when it comes to property, the current ownership for an American house is 8.7 years. And I ask, do you think it's going to take 40 years for platforms like Wealth Migrate to digitize and make this process a lot more efficient and to create the wealth creation that was created by the likes of E-Trade and other companies. And that's why we talk about the Amazon of global real estate and whether you can you know, actually afford not to be part of it. And we actually go further. Sometimes we say to ourselves, maybe we're playing too small when we just say the Amazon of real estate. Maybe it's actually the Amazon of personal wealth. As a team, we've got a broad-based team, which, which is a mixture of technology and, uh, and property, you know, different uh, and, and financial experts in, in different areas across five different continents. And if you want to understand our financials, we've got a one pager, which literally explains all our financials, the business, who we are, and, and what the projections are. Um, if you want to look forward, if you want to look backwards, we've actually got our full financial report, which we released to our shareholders, which includes my CEO letter, and also um, our Ken Williams, um, our CFO's uh, financial report. You can understand exactly where we're at. The good news is we're on track for break even this year, and have done substantially well in containing costs while driving revenue. When you look at the three metrics within the business, there's actually three metrics that drive us, the number of transactions, the average fees, and the average transaction. And our aim is to make $100 million in revenue, which would make us a billion dollar business. And so to do that, we need to increase the transactions, we need to decrease the transaction size. We're looking to do a million transactions in a calendar year at an average of 5% fees, 
with an average of $2,000. And that, that would make us a billion dollar company. And as I said in the financial projections, we actually show people how we want to do that and, and, and what our plan is. In terms of our exit strategy, well, you know, there's four different ways. One is a liquidity event, which is where we've copied Uber, Airbnb, SpaceX, Tesla, and some of the best companies that are out there. Um, a strategic sale to a big platform like a Facebook or a bank or a real estate investment trust. Uh, a dual listing between London and Hong Kong, which is where um, Ken's expertise are, and possibly even the tokenization of the business. Um, but we're really looking at a, at a five-year uh, term in terms of this. And then finally, you know, something that we launched in 2014 was what we called our wealth partner concept. And why it came about was three things. The first thing was I um, actually started my own company in 2004, International Property Solutions, and funded the, the start of the business. But to build a technology business is expensive, and I, was, I didn't have enough capital to grow the company as fast as I should be. The second thing was, is that our investors who were investing in the deals came along to us and said, we'd love to invest in the platform. And I was like, well, that's not possible. And then the third thing was, I read a book called uh, Behind the Cloud, which is all about Salesforce. And in 1999, a guy by Mark Benioff went out to the venture capitalists and the institutions, and he said, I've got a great idea. I want to help people put their their data and their CRM customer relation management systems in the cloud. And people laughed at him and, and said, it's impossible, it's never gonna happen. So he said, fine. So he went to his customers, he said, you already believe in the concept, you're using it, you're investing. Why don't you become a shareholder in my company, which they did. And today it's the 14th biggest technology company in the world. And so we thought that was a brilliant idea. And in 2014, we launched our wealth partner concept. And you know, the six different areas, we call it our wealth collaborative economy. And as we say to people, it's empowered people who are co-creating a better world. Now, again, it is not for everybody. Um, it's, it's really is by invitation only. And what's important is we say there's three things that, that, that um, attract people to be wealth partners and attract us to invite them. The first is they want to make a profit. The second is they want to join a global like-minded community where they can learn, grow, and invest together. It's about becoming a global citizen. And you know we've got we've got members or, or shareholders, wealth partners now in 43 countries, and you're dealing with the top one percent of the top one percent. It's the people who just want to get better and better and better, learn and grow with like-minded people. And the third is they want to have a purposeful impact on the planet. And if those three resonate with you, then I would highly recommend considering becoming a wealth partner. And I wanted to share with you a little video. We asked uh, some of our wealth partners who said, "What has the experience been like?" of being a wealth partner, and it's a two and a half minute video, so I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but I wanted to just share with you what um, their experience was. Um, of Inspired. Freedom. Abundance. Credibility. Enlightened. Impactful. Powerful. Enabling. Unimaginable. Peace of mind. Phenomenal. Total honesty. Reliable. Genius. Engaged. Excited. Hopeful. Exponential. Exponential. Empowered. Connected. Dream. Innovative. Global diversity. Opportunity. Freedom. Change. Excited. Ocamoso. Blessed. Empowered. Inodanis. Incredible, privileged, revolutionary, super, disruptive, support, change, empowering, excited, interesting, evolving, global, opportunity, buzzing, powerful, fortunate, it's possible, work, community. So, uh, I know that. Uh, it's uh, late at night and uh, I'm conscious of everyone's uh, time. So if you want to watch that whole video, we can share that video with you. I think it just gives you a sense of, of the experience that people get. And what's really important for me is that, you know, if it's just about the money and the numbers, then, then we're probably not the right people and the right community to be part of because you get so much more um, as being part of this uh, global community. And like I showed you earlier, you know, you're not investing in an IPO you're actually coming up the value chain and getting involved a lot earlier. And that's one of the reasons why we went out to Cedars. Uh, we did a, a launch with them uh, about a year, and a year, 18 months ago almost. 
And what's interesting is this is like a mini IPO. It took us, it took us five months to get everything accredited. We had to prove everything, the business model, the numbers, the valuations, everything. And um, you, know, you can literally go and read it all. So if I go online, we can go and read it. It's fully regulated with by the uh, FCA, which is the regulator in the UK. So I mean, you can actually go and read all about it. It's all live information um, online. So you go to cedars.com uh, forward slash Volmogate, and you can go and see all about uh, the launch and what was put together here. Uh, the idea, you can read about the idea, the market, the team, the updates. Uh, you can see the amount of money raised, the valuations, everything. It, it's, it's all here um, in terms of the information. So what's, what's, what's great for people is they've got the transparency. And like I said to you, we raised $2.5 million from 863 investors in, in 43 countries. Now, really where, where we're at and, and when we did that launch, the valuation of the company was actually valued at $1.61. Um, we gave a discount to Cedars because they came in as an institutional investor. Because what they do is they aggregate all their investors together and they invest as one investor. So it's an institutional investor and we gave them a, a value of, of $1.50. Um, our current valuation, and, and Ken updated all our shareholders uh, literally about two weeks ago, um, is currently sitting between $2 uh, to $2.70. Um, in fact, we had a meeting just today where we're going to launch a, a, a $10 million product uh, later this month, or next month, sorry, May. Um, and we'll be valuing uh, the shares at $2 uh, minimum. And um, the opportunity that presented itself over the last uh, month, so the last uh, four to five weeks, was where we had uh, one investor um, that came in for $250,000, so one larger investor, and they haven't been able to participate um, for various different reasons. And we eventually said, look, you know, we, we can't, we're about to do this $10 million raise at uh, $2 a share. And you know, we have to close out this round. And so what it allowed people to do was, was the opportunity was to allow people to invest at the same value as Cedars, so $1.61 a share, um, which was effectively a 25% discount. And the way that we've done it um, always is that we've done it in providing people with three tranches. So you've got the silver level, which is where you invest a minimum of $10,000, and it's at $1.61. You've got the gold level, which is a minimum of $25,000. And, um, and at that level, we've actually arbitraged the, the exchange rate. So we'll actually do, you know, we, if we'll take the RAND amount. Um, and the reason being is we've got a lot of expenses in RANDs. And so we can offset that. And also you become a legacy investor, which means you pay no fees on the platform for life. Okay. And then the plat a platinum member is someone who invests $250,000 or more. Um, we don't actually have that amount in this allocation, but if you are interested, let us know and we can see what we can do. Um, and they actually get the discount at $1.50, so the same as Cedars. Um, they would get a, a 15 Rand um, hedged. They would also be a legacy investor and they would be a, a Class A um, shareholder, um, which are the institutional level um, shareholders. So that's really the, the breakdown of the three. And um, what I would suggest, if you're interested, is I'm going to put up a, a little poll here uh, just quickly and just ask people, you know, are you interested in, in what you've uh, heard and seen around the um, value of, uh, of, of, you know, where the company's going, platforms in, in, in themselves, coronavirus, and whether you think it's going to push these trends and accelerate them or whether it's going to slow them down, whether you think the world is going to collapse into a heap and, uh, you know, you should sit on your hands and do nothing. It's quite interesting. Ray Dalio actually said, in, uh, in that video that the very worst thing to do is to sit on cash and that you know things like private equity um, and, and property you know things where you where you where you've got predictable income um, are actually you know very good um, investments but what's also important is that you need to be able to diversify you can't have all your money in one place and it becomes really really important around this whole diversification strategy so I've got a little poll up and I would encourage you just to just to answer the poll. I'm not going to leave it up for too long. Um, it's just interesting for us. We'd love to get the feedback in terms of how we're adding value to people and, and whether you think, uh, you know, what, what your thoughts are. You can't be right or wrong. It is what it is. I just wanted to share with you quickly. I've got a story I want to share with you. But before I do, I just wanted to share with you quickly on that poll. You know, if you were interested, which level do you think would, uh, would suit you between silver? Uh, reminding you that a silver is, is a $10,000 investment. Uh, gold is a $25,000 investment, and um, at a gold level, you can actually hedge the rand. So 
it's a very good RAND offset. If you consider the RAND is currently at 18 or 19, you're getting it at 15. And, um, and then, as I said, platinum is an institutional level investor and, um, and, and you've got the opportunity. Now, just, just as a matter of interest, one of the things that I, uh, I find very interesting is that we are going to be launching this, uh, this $10 million product and the, the share price will be $2. And the minimum investment we agreed today will, will be at an institutional level. So it'll only be $250,000 uh, per investor. So this will be the last opportunity to be able to get in uh, below $250,000 as a, as a shareholder, um, you know, just in terms of where, where we're going and, and, and what we're doing. Uh, because Ken and, and the board are very much driving the, the move towards institutional investment um, in, in terms of our growth capital. The reason being is that we, we're getting to that break-even stage now and we, we want to be able to, to basically, you know, really, really grow and, and, uh, and capitalize the business. So I've got two more polls, but before I do, I wanted to share a story with you. And we talk a lot about purpose. And in the wealth movement, we've got three legs uh, to us. We've got entrepreneurship for children in education. We've got empowering women with access to wealth, education, and, and the whole women and wealth. And then we've got uh, empowering the 99% to be able to invest like the top 1% using technology. And this was a young man called Bongi. And in 2015, you know, we were teaching children about entrepreneurship education. And uh, he was just the most amazing man. He had incredible tenacity. And he won a prize. We flew him up to Johannesburg. He'd never been on a plane and, and, and anything like that. And um, he shared with our community how his dream was to go to a private school. And so through our community, we actually crowdfunded him. And we got him his dream to go to a private school um, in, when he was 13. And he's now in matric, which is the, the final year of, of school. And, uh, you know, our community and, and, uh, has funded him um, through the, his entire journey. And what's so interesting is that, you know, for me, this year, he's, he's, he's going to finish school. He wants to become a, an entrepreneur. He wants to go to university next year. He's, uh, he's captain of the hockey team. He's, he's captain of the, of the provincial hockey team. But the part I like most is that he works so hard and, and, while all his peers were on holiday, the Christmas holidays, he worked six days a week um, on the boats and he, he made himself uh, 1,500 Rand. And at the end of the holiday, he came to me and he said, listen, Scott, I've got 1,500 Rand, which is roughly $100. And he said, I want to invest. And I just thought, it's just incredible. Like there you've got a 17-year-old who's just turned 18. He knows the power of compound investing and getting started. And he wants to get started. And what I find so incredibly powerful is that everyone that contributes and empowers our company, not only as shareholders, but as a community, is empowering people like Bongi. And imagine when you know one Bongi can become two, two become, can become four, four become eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32, et cetera, et cetera. That's how we change the world. We don't empower a billion people at once, we empower one person at a time. And so to finish off, you know, this is a picture of my son. He was five years old, he was playing Monopoly. And we always tend to, you know, someone asked a question, you know, can my son invest? Yes, we can help under 18s invest now. We would highly recommend the Starter Pack because they, it's all about the education and the community, which is so important for them. But in simple terms, my son's been investing since the age of five and earning a passive income from property. And that's what we call <coughs> smart investing. His dad, with an incredible team, has turned a childhood you know, fantasy of, of marrying together technology and 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 uh, and property and ultimately making monopoly available and now is diversified across residential and commercial on four different uh, continents it's what we call smart investing the wealthiest people in the world for them it's all about generational wealth it's what we call smart investing and our dream is to put smart investing in every single person's pocket and so tonight, we've shared with you the trends. We've shared with you where the world's going. We've shared with you our beliefs and opinions. They are not 100% accurate. No one has a crystal ball. But we've also shared with you the solution we've been building for six years now already to build the solution for the decade that's coming. And I think it is extremely exciting that actually things like Corona are pushing us up that adoption curve. And things like smart investing are becoming a true reality. And so if you want to be part of that journey, tonight is an invitation to, to apply to, to, to become part of that, that journey. And as I said to you before, 
you know, there's there's three things that people uh, generally resonate with uh, when when they want to become a wealth partner. The one is that they want to make a profit. Two is that they want to join a global like-minded community where they can learn, grow, and invest together, and ultimately aim to become global citizens, which is what we all are endeavouring to do, and or are already. And three is we want to have a purposeful impact on the planet. And if those three resonate with you, then then my invitation is for you to fill in one of these surveys and let us know what you're thinking. You know, chat to myself or Lee or, or one of the wealth consultants and let us help you uh, come on our journey. If it doesn't suit you, no problem. This is not for everybody. If, if you're all about the numbers and a return at you know, profit at all costs, great. Uh, that's just not our business model and, and not where we're going. And, um, you know, there's no problem with that. But, but I like to get very clear with people up front um, as to what we're doing. And equally, if you're not sure, don't get involved. You know, if you want more information, great. Our three core values are trust, transparency, and alignment. There's no hardcore, hard sale. We don't do that. We only want people to participate that, that have the information and, and can make an educated, informed decision. What is important, though, is it is on a first-come, first-serve uh, basis. We do need to close this round out now fairly quickly. We, we pretty much are ready to launch the $10 million opportunity, and, um, and, and we, we just need to close out uh, the small amount that, that is left and it will be on a first come, uh, first opportunity. And then from there on, you'll be able to participate as an institutional investor um, with minimum investments of $250,000. And so Lee, that is all uh, from my side. Um, I, oh, sorry, I do have the poll up. And if you're wanting to be a strategic partner, you know, if you're an estate agent, a financial planner, a bank, an institutional bank, a platform, a property developer, you know, any of them, you know, a, a, a real estate educator, a financial educator, you know, whatever it is, and that's what a strategic partner is, and, and that's what you, you, you would tick the box as a strategic partner. And um, I don't know, Lee, from your side, if there's anything else that I'm uh, missing or that I've forgotten tonight, uh, which is of relevance uh, to everyone just to talk through. No, Scott, I think that you covered it all. It was a very informative and great webinar. You can actually see that you love speaking about this because it definitely flows through you. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I uh, definitely underestimated it by saying that we would be online for um, 90 minutes. We're almost on two hours, but it has been great. Thank you so much. We really do appreciate your time. If anyone has any questions and didn't uh, put them in the chat box, um, you can reach out to me directly. I'm happy to help. One of the wealth partners can, uh, one of the wealth consultants can also help. Um, so just feel free to reach out. And I think Lee, just before we jump off, and sorry, I know I heard you say 90 minutes when we started, but it's really hard to condense 20 years worth of passion into you know less than two hours. Uh, so I apologise to everyone. Um, you know, it's, it is a topic I love. But what I'd suggest is I'm happy to stay on a little bit and answer if there's any questions uh, that are here. I have put up a poll as well um, around the blended product, which we are going to be bringing to market, which is a, a wealth protection opportunity where you get diversification across medical, aged care, fixed income, which is taking advantage of the opportunities in the stock market and a private equity investment in wealth migrate. Um, as I said, it's going to be a $10 million um, a diversification opportunity. Um, but it will be only available to institutional investors at uh, $250,000 uh, or above. Um, so if people are interested, you know, let us know and, and we can let you know about that at a later stage. If, if, um, if you're interested in becoming a wealth partner or a shield in the company, you know, now's the time to do it because once this goes live, then they, you, know, you won't be able to participate at, at the lower levels. Um, okay, so I want to I want to close that poll. And while uh, you, you'll basically have the screen up that, that has the different uh, uh, calls to action, whether you want to get started, you know, with the starter pack or the platform, or reach out to Lee as, as she said. Let me look through the Q and A here quickly and just see if there's anything uh, relevant that, that we haven't answered. I know Lee's been very kindly answering everyone. Um, uh, you can download New Power PDF free. Okay, thank you very much, Avanesh. So just Google that if someone wants it. Uh, people asking about connectivity issues and stuff. Um, we do record these, so unfortunately, you know, I, I do have a hundred meg line here, so I don't normally have problems, but um, you never know. Um, if you have any contacts, 
So uh, I hope to keep in contact. A perfect reach out to Lee or myself or one of the wealth partners. I uh, sorry, one one of the wealth consultants. Uh, happy to happy to help. Um, will there be a recording? Yes. Uh, we'll share the slides so they're actually on. Um, I'll upload them to SlideShare so that you can uh, get access to them. Are you able to invest in wealth migrate and not actually investing in property? Uh, yes, Clinton. That's that's what we were talking about tonight, uh, where you can actually become a shareholder in the platform. So that's like saying I want to own shares in Amazon, but I don't want to buy the umbrella. Um, it, it pretty much allows you to participate. Um, if my son wanted to invest in property, would he need to pay the 197 if if I'm on the platform already? Uh, Helen, that's what I was talking about. I would highly recommend that they do um, because it's not only about the investment; it's about the community, it's about the education, it's about the knowledge. And um, you know, I, I reckon there's no better way uh, for for anyone to start, uh, whether they're a child or a teenager or a 20 year old or a 60 year old. Now, if, you, if you're very sophisticated, you don't have to start with a starter pack. You know, I often have people come to me and say, I've got more than $100, can I get started? Yes, we've had plenty of high net worth and institutional people invest more than a million dollars you know, per deal. Um, Ingrid's asking about empowering women. So it's something we're very passionate about, Ingrid. and. Hilda Lundestead is actually one of our largest shareholders and investors, uh, invested a significant amount of capital many years ago. And what was very close to her heart was the whole uh, purpose around um, changing the world and empowering people, but specifically women and wealth and, and um, that whole space. And I think Lee, you guys actually had a meeting about it literally on Monday night, I stand to be corrected. Yeah, we did, Scott. Um, so we have started the process and planning out what it's going to look like and how we're going to launch that. So um, if anyone wants to chat about that further, please just let me know. Ingrid, I will reach out to you. Thank you very much um, and have a chat around that as well. So early stages, but we are very enthusiastic about it. We want to get it up and going as soon as possible. Give me two seconds. This is my son. Hello, John G. John D. John D. Daddy's just finishing the webinar. I'll call you when I'm done. Okay. So he's trying to learn to go to sleep in his bed on his own. <laughs> so I put a special thing on that he could call me anytime. So I don't want to break that for him. Um, okay. So Andre's asking about the links. We will send the links. Um, yes, there will be a follow up email with the links. Um, Ingrid, uh, uh, Lee can reach out um, with regards to the documentation. Uh, can you also buy shares in Wild Migrate? So Tracy, that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. Uh, so uh, becoming a wealth uh, partner is our internal language for being a shareholder in Wild Migrate, in the company that owns all the assets, the platform, the technology, the revenue streams, everything. It's all, you know, Wealth University, Wild Migrate, Wealth Create. It's all under one opportunity. It's you invest in one company, and, and that's. You, you, you invest in the same place, I invest and we invest, we're all, in, we're all shareholders in the same place. Um, so, so Tracy, in, in simple terms, um, Lee can send you the information around uh, the process. It's actually fairly simple. We send you a subscription agreement. Um, it's got the, you know, basically, you know, what's involved. Uh, you, you know, based on the amount of money you want to invest, there's a certain share price and number of shares. You get to, you know, participate. Um, as long as you're allowed to participate and qualify, um, then then you know we we sign that uh, Jill sign that subscription agreement. Lee actually handles this as head of community. Uh, we give you the bank details. You send the money overseas because it, it, we've got bank accounts in Hong Kong and London. We are a global company, not a South African company. And uh, and then you get your share certificate. So and, and it's a digital share certificate. So it's all online uh, with complete transparency. I don't know, Lee, if I'm missing anything, but that's literally the process. That is. That's spot on. So, Tracy, I will reach out to you um, after this webinar and give you all the information. Um, Zanelli is saying, what, what would I need to do? So, Zanelli, just, I mean, basically for anyone, you know, either reach out to us or let us know or if you've filled in the poll or, you know, it's too late now, the poll's gone. Just, just put in there, contact me. A couple of people have put in contact me. And Lee and the team will, will follow up, you know, um, probably tomorrow morning because it's really late now. Um, and and what we tend to do is, as I said, we'll give you all the information. We don't rush people. We've got no interest in hard selling people, but we do have to work on a first come, first serve basis. 
Um, will someone contact me to give me more details on specific aspects? And do you entertain the idea of helping individual investment plans, you know, help me help you? <laughs> um, I don't know exactly what that means, Andre, but I love the concept of help me help you. Our whole business has been built on partnerships. So if we can figure out a way to make one plus one equal three, we're all here. So, um, you know, yes, definitely let's chat. Again, you know, Lee is head of community and you've got her details on the screen here. And if you're watching the recording, the links are actually below. You can click on the links below and, um, you know, reach out to us. We, we, we believe if we can add value to you, then we as a company are growing. It's that simple. And if you can add value to us, then it's symbiotic and it's that whole win-win process. You know, I, I always like to talk about it. I, I learned this a couple of years ago. Everyone always thinks that wealth is like a pond and we're all sitting there with a spoon and the person with the biggest spoon and the person who can drink the fastest gets all the wealth. But it's actually not. Wealth is like a river. And, and the wider you make the river, the more people can participate. And the more people you get involved, the wider the river gets. And so we decided, why do we allow people to become shareholders and investors in our company? Well, we decided years ago, you know, we could have a little tiddly wing stream with tadpoles all on our own, or we could build an Amazon, you know, a river the size of the Amazon. And then everyone is going to, you know, get extremely wealthy in the process and be able to dip their spoon into that river whenever, whenever they want. Now, are we guaranteed success? Definitely not. We're like any company. There are risks involved in investing in a company. And it's important to understand those risks. Um, so, you know, there's risks on the downside, but the potential on the upside is, is also really, you know, really interesting. And again, what I get most out of being a shareholder at the moment, even if I've got no financial return, is all the growth I get uh, being part of that like-minded community. I, I don't know Lee, if, if it's the same for you, but it's one of the things I'm most grateful for is that, and it's something I never expected actually five, six years ago, is how much value I get out of the other wealth partners and all the information sharing, knowledge and growth that we get you know, from each other. Absolutely, Scott. I think that's one of our greatest assets is our different community groups that we have. Um, there's definitely learning that happens every day. And it's great that everyone interacts um, you know, freely amongst each other. It's quite an awesome thing to watch unfold. As I always say, you've got to have like-minded uh, people. So, uh, Ingrid, thanks for the comment. And as I said, Lee, Lee and yourself could connect. Jay asked if there's an affiliate program. Very much so. Hopefully tonight I shared with you multiple different uh, ways that we can do it. Um, so it's all built. Um, you know, it's, you, you can help people participate. You can add value to your clients. They remain your clients for life. Um, so it's a way to add more value to your clients and to build passive income streams. So, um, yes, that's uh, very much possible. Um, uh, so, uh, Peter's asking, uh, but can we get everything we cover from the website? Uh, from no, so Peter, we don't. I mean, we don't actively go through this in, in a huge amount of detail on the website. Um, <clears throat> there is the Cedars website, so I mentioned uh, cedars.com uh, forward slash wealth migrate. Um, you should be able to see my screen here. Um, we will also can send you the one pager, um, which which will explain um, you know the, the business and and the opportunity. And uh, it, it tends to be off market and, you know, by, by invitation only and, and, you know, through webinars like, like this that we do it. So it's not sort of publicly out there. But, but if you do want any information, we have to share anything, including our financials and stuff like we discussed. Um, thank you, Zanele. Um, thank you, Ingrid, in terms of women. So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. And Jay saying no scarcity. Yeah, Jay, I think that's probably, again, one of the things is that, you know, if people come from a scarcity mindset, then they wouldn't understand what we're talking about because it's old power values, old power model. It's all about scarcity. New power values, new power model is all about abundance. And, and that's really where, you know, where, where we're at, basically. Uh, please do pass the mention on uh, the information when you can. So, um, uh, Peter, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce your name, but, um, yeah, happily to do that. And I think, Lee, what we'll do is we'll, we'll follow up tomorrow with, with, a, um, with an email you know, to everyone that's registered uh, with the links to the different information, et cetera, and or reach out to one of the wealth consultants. Um, you've got these details here, and the last slide that I'll put up is uh, actually my details. So, um, you know, you've got my email there, but I'd recommend not emailing me. Um, if you do want to contact me, send me a WhatsApp. Um, I, am, I am a little bit crazy, so, you know, I would, I would recommend, you know, reach out to, to one of the wealth consultants as well. I'll just find that slide. I should, I should actually have it. Yeah, yeah, as well. 
um, just with all their details. So you've got Lee's details and uh, my details, but there's also there's a slide gone with all their details on. Oh, just got to go back far now to find it. <laughs> there it is. My computer's uh, my computer's saying it's uh, it's a bit tired. Just by the way, we've been running this webinar, so we haven't had the update. Can we do exercise? <clears throat> completely, completely different, uh, completely different track. But uh, apparently, they're letting everyone know whether we can do exercise or not. I think that's going to be the first thing that you and I are going to jump on and check as soon as we are off this webinar. And what is our new normal going to be as? South Africa enters stage four of the coronavirus lockdown. Yeah, I forgot to mention, and I've actually, it's been so long now, I've, I keep talking about it. Most people don't know this. Lee's husband is in Saudi Arabia, and she's like, she's literally, I don't know what the right word is, but she's like marooned in South Africa and can't get home. So, uh, you know, these impacts are bigger on, on, on certain individuals than people realize. Um, but uh, just quickly, so there, there's Lee's details uh, for anyone that wants. Um, these were my details, and then uh, the wealth consultants are here to help hold everyone's hands, you know, walk you through the process, um, you know, between Fritz, David, uh, Alex, um, you might or might not have spoken to Cisco, who helps with the KYC or Megan. Uh, so we've got, you know, quite a quite a, a nice team of people that are there to help. Um, but I think basically it uh, mentioned wealth migrate in more conversations than not. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, within five kilometers of your house. Yay, we can do exercise oh, between six and nine. What happens if you want to do exercise in the evening? Um, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Maurice, for letting us know. Anyway, I think uh, that's probably enough. It's a late night. Um, thank you for everyone who's online. Um, you know, I, I love sharing this. Uh, Lee, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity uh, to share this with everyone. You know, I think really, you know, I'm, I'm really actually excited about where the world is going. You know, I think I think Corona is a, a massive frustration and and, and really irritating, um, but I think it was coming. I think the world correction was coming. We've been talking about it for months. In fact, I've been talking about it for years. If you go look at my YouTube videos, uh, so have many of you know other people much with much more authority. But what I think is exciting is that we've been creating the solution for where the world is going. Uh, we're not the only ones. Other people are as well. But what is really important is that you know if you're going to catch a wave, if you're a surfer. And you wake up and you you're on the beach and you're sitting there with your board and you look up and there's this beautiful wave coming it's too late you can't paddle out and catch the wave the only way to catch a good wave is to be at backline and when that good wave comes to be trained to to have been through the hard yards good and bad and so that you can catch that beautiful wave and the metaphor i leave you with is that Corona is 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 a really tough situation. The global economy is in a tough situation, but it's forcing us, whether we like it or not, into World for 5.0. And we've built that solution, and we've been sitting at backline, telling everyone about it. And now suddenly that wave's coming, and we invite you to jump on the surfboard with us. That's all from me, Lee. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate your time. I know that I'm keeping you um, ultra busy recently, um, but thank you everybody for joining us. It's really been a great pleasure sharing this evening with you. So wherever you are in the world, we hope that you are safe and healthy um, and we wish you a good night. Thank you, Ron. Good night.